The we gang is all here. We don't have to delete them tonight. <laughs> I know. Good evening. Welcome to the that. August 19th meeting of the Hampton Board of Selectmen. Wait a minute. Stand for a to fly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to introduce the board. To my far left, Selectman Mike Pierce. To my immediate left, Selectman Phil Bean. To my far right, Selectman Mike Clough. To his left, Selectman Mary Louise Woolsey. And to my immediate right, Town Manager Fred Welch. To uh, start this evening's agenda with public comment. Would anybody from the public wish to comment? Nancy? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Nancy Stiles, the Hayden Circle in Hampton. And last week I was watching the selectmen's meeting and I <coughs> actually was a little bit shocked when I heard the discussion going on about the possibility of repealing 79E. The purpose of 79E is revitalization of a community. And um, deferment is only on the difference between the previous tax evaluation and the new tax evaluation. So you get the, the uh, you receive the taxes on the previous and you just wait for whatever time you determine for the balance. 7090 also allows uh, for the burn properties. Um, that was one of the things that I worked with the senator uh, from the North Country on because uh, Berlin, you know, was exp experiencing a lot of burned out properties and he, wanted, uh, he also wanted them to be available for revitalization. <coughs> and the power really is in the hands of the Board of Selectmen. You approve uh, the application, and then you if you if you approve it, then you determine whether it's the deferment is for one year, three years, five years, whatever it is that you determine. So the, the power is really in your hands. And we've had a couple of uh, charrettes here <coughs> looking at uh, revitalization of the uptown district. I think we all would like to see that revitalized again and and up and running and being a booming town. Um, and Mike and Phil both run businesses, so I know you know the value of return on investment, and the rest of you have all been exposed to the business uh, community prior to your, your life here uh, on the board. The unsightly property at the corner of Winnicunna and um, Lafayette Road currently has an assessed value of under $200,000. That's what you're receiving taxes on currently. The 2008 assessment was over $325,000. So if someone saw fit to invest in that property and make changes uh, to it, say the new assessment was $450,000, you would want to uh, uh, encourage them to go forward because you would be receiving uh, taxes on the $325,000 plus the <laughs> current assessed value because that does that's the last time that property was assessed at that rate and you would move it up according to today's rates. So you would get that additional money immediately and then you would get the uh, deferred money whether you gave it three years or five years or whatever you gave it. So you knew you would know when that additional money would be coming in. Uh, the A block at the beach uh, which currently hosts a parking lot is currently assessed at 2.5 million. And when the original property had an assessment of 5.5 million. So if, a, if construction took place and an application for deferment was approved, again, you would immediately get an increase of taxes on the additional three plus million dollars with uh, guaranteed future increases with a new assessed value. So you are getting more money than you are in its current position with the, with the knowledge that it's going to uh, increase uh, after the deferment is over. And also, it encourages business and uh, revitalization of, of our town. And in the case of the properties at the beach, uh, we're looking at a window of 12 weeks for businesses to have an opportunity to make money weather dependent. Um, and who's going to invest big dollars in a town uh, if, if you can't provide some sort of an incentive uh, while the town receives additional revenues in the process? Another example might be. Um, McGurk's. Now, I don't know whether they have applied for or intend to apply for a deferment or not, but they've made great investments in their properties at the beach. Now, those are people that have lived in this town for a long time. If they were to come in and apply, I would want to 
encourage them to upgrade their properties and give them the benefit of deferment as well. I mean, they're longtime citizens here. In my opinion, if the Board of Selectmen put forth an article to repeal uh, 79E, uh, which the citizens of the town passed in 2011, just a couple of years ago, with over a two to one uh, vote by the citizens, you're making a public statement that, the ha that Hampton doesn't want to offer incentives to revitalize its town. Now, I know that you guys at the board, and ladies, lady, <laughs> excuse <laughs> me, excuse me, Mary Louise, uh, I know that you want to encourage growth of this town and, and re revitalization and, and taxes coming in so that to pay for the roads and stuff that, that you need to repair. But uh, it's not really an inviting uh, statement, nor is it at all visionary, in my opinion, if you, if you put forth a, a Warren article from the Board of Selectmen to repeal 79E. So I ask that you give serious thought to, uh, in your discussion before you take any action on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Somebody else from the public? Charlie? <laughs> Skip. Thank you. Uh, William Sullivan, 12 Colonial Circle. <coughs> Pardon me. I noticed on tonight's agenda, and I haven't really had a chance to talk in depth with Chris Silver about it, but I see the traffic signal at High Street, Exeter Road and Lafayette Road is on there. And I just wanted to offer my opinion. Um, I've heard some rumblings about it lately. The way that signal is phased right now works great. It works fine. Um, if the drivers are a little bit patient, um, and they just go through there once and figure out how it works. Uh, it's moving traffic through there, and it's not allowing cars to get trapped in the intersection like they used to. So that's just my opinion, um, and I hope you'll consider that to just leave it alone, because if you get involved with it, you're going to find, I think, if you had a uh, so-called expert come in, a traffic engineer come in, he's going to take a look or she's going to take a look at the walk cycle that's there, and it's not completely legal and you may be biting off more than you want. So that's just, again, my opinion. So, thank you. Somebody else from the public? Charlie? <coughs> thank you. I know the Senator just mentioned you were talking about the repeal of 79. I didn't know anything about it, but <laughs> as far as it was going to be a Warren article possibility. But I was here actually to talk about the A block, and I know there's been a couple of votes, and height's going to be an issue. And there's a couple of votes on that, so maybe there should be a few different subjects that should, voters should have another shot at. But, you know, I'd just like to say there's probably one thing we can all agree on. Murphy's Law. When this A block burnt down, we had, it was in February, we had sustained winds of 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. People soon forget, power got knocked out that night. Yeah. There was power, not the next day there was no power. I'm not sure what time it finally did come back on, but you couldn't get a coffee on Hampton Beach. I don't know if they ever determined what caused that fire. I, I honestly have no idea. We also had a fire engine that was stuck in a firehouse. You know, mm -hmm. Th These are things that happen. You know, <coughs> the weather, be it in season or out of season, the storm events can be very costly in, in many different you know, inexpensive ways, whether it's from business loss or storm damage. A recent ZBA decision just changed the heights. As far as I'm concerned, it's my opinion, obviously. Basically, every, everyone just got another floor. 30% over the law. Basically, we got a 65-foot building versus what was allowed at 50. The next request is 100% over. The most recent development and proposed developments. Do they have first floor walls that are designed to be knocked out by the ocean and still let the building stand? One might think before you build, invest, or insure these projects, you might seriously consider the effect climate change has had on the ocean community. There was a meeting in this room today at 1.30. I saw Mary Louise there. But, but for 200 miles, Hurricane Sandy was us. They've now changed the building, at, building elevations down where, the, where it happened, Hurricane Sandy, from 8 to 13 feet for, per, for uh, insurance purposes. I believe our elevation is nine. Well, if you do the same thing, you'd be talking another five anyway. We've heard from developers, commissions, and boards, and citizens that this is going to derive tax revenue. We've been told projects like this will reduce our taxes. Personally, I've owned a house in Hampton for over, two, over 32 years, and the only way your taxes go down is with an approved abatement. What about the costs? You know, 
What about past flow rates versus projected f flow rates? We might have a new pump station, but if the capacity of the treatment plants or its yeah. elevation come into question, yeah. then we're all up the creek. Yep. And I think you, think you can all figure out the name of the creek. <laughs> <laughs> I stood to say at the last approved 65 foot, there was no way four members and actually three can do it. But the ZBA should have the power to usurp the actions and the intentions of the voters twice. This proposal flies in the face of the master plan and the Hampton yeah. voters. There's no way yeah. that boards or commissions known by acronyms like the ZBA, BOS, or the HBAC, for example, should decide what's best for the town and make a mockery out of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Somebody else from the public? Rusty? Yes, Russ Pryor, 225 Toll Farm Road. A couple of things. One, I want to thank I want to thank the uh, Hamptons 375th Commission for organizing the event we had last weekend. Uh, it, that event was not put on by one person, one commission. That was an entire community that put that on, uh, right from public works to the police to fire, uh, to the restaurants in town, uh, to the local organizations that are out there, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, whoever was there to help out. I'm really sad that we didn't have as much participation from the town members as I would have liked to have seen. I want to thank Mr. Pierce for getting in the dunk booth. He cost me five bucks, but I put him <laughs> in. Uh, it was well worth it. Uh, the, but I want to thank everybody that, that helped in this town participate in that because I think it was a, it was a great event, and I, I just wish it was better attended. The second thing I see on here is, is you, you're talking about fire prevention. I, I've he heard you talking about it over the past couple of weeks, and I want to... Uh, I'm glad you're now finally talking about it. Uh, that, there's a job that is pretty a thankless job sometimes for the person that's working it, but he's overworked and he needs the help. And I've heard some people say, well, it's, it's the summertime businesses. It's not just the summertime businesses. Our building permits are up. How, I, I, I know increasingly, I don't know how many, but they're up very much. That position needs a f to be another full-time position, and I, I would hope that you people would support that Support the business community, get, getting timely permits done. Supporting the fire department, getting the permits out. Uh, that that job is, is he's buried over there. I, if you've ever gone over, you see stuff piled on his desk. Uh, he's working as hard as he can, but he uh, does need the help. And I would uh, I would hope you would support filling that position fully. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Someone else from the public, Victor. Victor DeMarco, 11 Milburn Avenue. Uh, don't count to three minutes yet. This is the do it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you were discussing with the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the parking situation. Uh, you had a little bit incorrect information. I thought I corrected for you. We have always been open, and we open at 7 a.m., and we close at 9 or 10. The uh, Seafood Festival usually stops at 8, and we usually sometimes even close at 8 because you don't need someone there while they're exiting. Every one of our uh, three lots are exitable. And the precinct might have charged $25 for the whole s uh, seafood endeavor for their, uh, we charged the going rate of the day and $25 for overnight. And that was approved by previous boards. Uh, I don't have that in writing, <laughs> but uh, that was approved by previous boards. That when a vendor came in and, and they were going to stay there overnight, because we never did overnight parking, yeah. they were going to pay that day's rate and $25 for staying overnight. Now, it could have been $10 that day, depending on the weather, is how you, we judge what we charge for the day. Uh, so I would think you want to take that into consideration, okay? Um, and they have always been manned. They've always been opened at 7 a.m. because maybe uh, 15 years ago, they used to come in, and we didn't man them until uh, 9 o'clock, and half the lot to be full. <laughs> <laughs> and that's before you give me authority to give out parking tickets. And, and uh, just a little aside, uh, we are currently $65,000 ahead of last year, effective Sunday. 
Uh, we are ahead of the complete year of last year, effective yesterday, and we still have two weeks left in the Seafood Festival. So we've really uh, earned some money this year. You know. yeah, I thought you'd like to know that. Now you can start counting the three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't want to take this as a personal affront to the chairman, but I heard something at a meeting three weeks ago that was very disturbing to me as a taxpayer of this town. It's my impression that he has applied for the director's job at the, the beach. I would like the following questions. I know you don't answer these things. Asked. When did he put his application in? He is our prime representative negotiating for the town. So it's what I consider that application to be as his first interview. I mean, who else would you hire but the guy that you're going up against? The exact same thing that just happened in the, in the state senate. Oh, yeah. It's the exact same thing. I, I relate it to that. I certainly do. Because this is the second time it's happened with you. You had an opportunity to vote a year ago on a very important situation here, and you took your own consideration in, into before the town. You withheld your vote because you wanted the job. Instead of being there as an elected official and making the decision for the town, not yourself. And this is the same thing I find that's going on right now. He, is, he was the prime negotiator for the town with the state of the last previous uh, agreement we have. He is the one now doing it. He went almost spastic when you people suggested we get six million. Town manager says four and a half million. He goes even spastic on that. I, we pay the town manager over $100,000 a year to run this town. And if I look at my interviews, or my, my tape recordings, I would say we have two town managers. And I think the board, the chair, the chairman of this board takes that role on for the last five years. He makes all the decisions and he suggests it to all of you what to do. When you tell me that you have applied, it would be like our attorney being our representative in contract negotiation, having a job application with the lawyers of the union, wanting to be work for them when we get done with this negotiation. I think it's terrible. I think you should resign. And I think we should go back the way it was with uh, Mr. Bean as the chairperson and you back to where you, were, where, where you should be as the vice chairman. I, I think it's, it was an absolute insult. I waited last week. I was going to come up last week because I thought one of you would mention it. You know, you can't apply for it. You just can't do that. I, I, the people aren't stupid. I'm not stupid, you know. He comes up with statistics about the uh, uh, garbage trucks. He tells you we pay, it's only going to cost us $25,000. Well, I looked at that uh, formulation he made. We have a five-year note that he's amortized over 10 years. Now, the last time I did accounting, if you have a five-year note, it's for five years. You don't spread it over 10 years, even though you paid it in five years. I mean, I look at these statistics, and it drives me out of my mind. We paid $275,000 for those sidearm pickups. Waste management went up $70,000 one year. We, we just spent $2.8 million. Now, I don't want to talk about pickups. Mister, could you uh, summarize your time? Yeah, I wouldn't suggest you would want me to. Uh, everybody else went over three minutes. Uh, Victor, could you please summarize? I will. I think that the statistics that he's given you without asking, with the board asking him to do it, is just to cover himself. Because they're incorrect, and I think if you took the time to analyze them yourself, you'd realize it. $2.8 million we have spent, and we have nothing in return. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Points of clarification. Fred, to, to his points about the trucks and the amortization or whatever, who made that determination? Actually, the board made it. 
the finance director did the analysis, correct? The analysis was done in the finance department, yes. Okay. Yeah. Second of all, did I negotiate the last contract with the state? Did I participate? The whole board sure did. did. Did I participate in discussions with the state? No. Did I participate in finalizing the last one? That was the DPW director, correct? DPW director and myself. Right. So there was a substantial amount of information there. I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, I take it personally. It was intended personally. And I'm going to move on, but I just don't think that that kind of dialogue is good for the town of Hampton, and I don't think it goes very far to attracting people to public positions, knowing that you're going to take that. You are done, Victor. You are done. Next item on the agenda. Arthur? You make the rules as we go along, right? Art Moody, 3 Thompson Road. <clears throat> I didn't uh, finish uh, my Goody Cole story last week. <laughs> I thought I had final, finally put her to rest. But uh, She's back. I, I described the beginning of our closing ceremony a week ago Sunday afternoon on Meeting House Green. And I only mentioned Mr. McClung, whose longtime personal project was to identify the Goody Cole stone that was put in there 50 years ago. And... There are others who were involved in that ceremony included uh, Senator uh, uh, Stiles, District 24, and she read a resolution from the President of the Senate, Peter Blagden, I guess his name is, who, by the way, is going to resign this week from as Senate President, he <laughs> said last Friday. Uh, and uh, she read the re resolution. Which I guess is in. We don't even ha we don't have copies of it. I guess it's uh, <coughs> it's in the historical society. Uh, and also Betty Moore, director, uh, historical society museum, uh, gave a background of the stone and uh, introduced uh, the uh, what was going to go on marking the stone in, in the ground in front of the stone. The other thing I want to bring up was the uh, <coughs> was the traffic lights that's on the agenda. Uh, you you had an expert come in and and uh, you changed so that the arrow for the middle lane left turns come after the north south green, but they uh, those middle lanes also have the north south green green and they go into the intersection still and when there's a break in the traffic in their lane they try to turn left. <coughs> I would suggest for that three road intersection which uh, after the Civil War was called the Union Square uh, it had the town pump and trough for horses and so forth. Uh, the one that Hannaford Brothers so bought when they built the supermarket 25 years ago at Kershaw Avenue and Hannaford Drive has it correct like the rest of stop signs all the way to Portsmouth on Route 1 there's a red arrow mm -hmm. in the middle lane no turn on red arrow and it, at the beginning of a cycle north-south green if there's a car in one of those middle lanes that gets a green arrow to turn mm -hmm. and there's a still a red light for the <coughs> north south or south lane that seems to be <coughs> logical you have got nobody going into the intersection until that green arrow uh, <coughs> I noticed today <coughs> that the sign over the <coughs> superstructure of the lights at Kershaw has that metal sign that says no, large no, in fact, northbound lane, for the northbound lane, no turn on red arrow, and it's wiggling back and forth. And those two bolts eventually, in the wind, they're going to fall, uh, make the uh, sign fall. And it's right over a pedestrian crosswalk. So you might want to look into that. The last thing I want to bring up is the last week's uh, <coughs> St. Magnus uh, Townhouse uh, request to do some tree trimming at Ruth G. Dempson Park. 
on Ocean Boulevard. Uh, Marilyn uh, Wallingford mentioned that Ruth Stempson always said that the town flower was the pink petunia, <coughs> which was the first time I'd heard that. Uh, I don't know of any town body that ever designated that. Perhaps it was the garden club, but I can I can think of other colors. Uh, our predecessors in this area, using this area, were the Native Americans that named it Winnicunit, beautiful place, place of the pines, and pines are generally green. And then their successors, the English, the English settlers, 375 years ago, by way of Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, led to 1938 300th anniversary and the selectmen on their a recent law established the town seal. And on that town seal are three red roses. So if there's any town flower, I would say red rose is it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. Anybody else from the public? John? Good evening, uh, John and I in 2 Walnut Avenue here in Hampton. Um, I'm here to speak tonight in public comment with regard to 79E. Um, I was a, uh, a strong supporter of 79E uh, back then, and I continue to be. One of the reasons I was a strong supporter of the way the 79E was written was that it gave local communities an opportunity to revitalize but it also gave the jurisdiction of that revitalization <coughs> to a board of selectmen in this particular case. The board of selectmen under 79E is 100% empowered to make decisions on who gets a 79E relief and who does not. I look at 79E much beyond the Hampton Beach and all of the revitalization that's going on in Hampton Beach. I look at it also for the entire town. And I also look at it as a futuristic device to support and help. Let's just take for a minute Morelli's, Toby Merrill. What happens to them if they have a fire? Cassassa Ryan. What happens to them if their building burns down? They would want, knowing who they are, they would want to rebuild. But because of today's cost, construction, and redevelopment, would they be able to without some assistance from the community? This is where I think 79E comes in. But once again, it is this board's decision to go ahead and grant Morelli's, Toby Merrill, Casasa Ryan, that relief. It's not a shoe in it's not a given. So I would ask this board to uh, think seriously about keeping the Warren article as is and let it ride and you maintain that power that you have to either say yes or no. Thank you. Thank you, John. Somebody else from the public? Bob? wanted to talk about 79E also and I I don't want to rehash some of the things that Nancy Senator Stiles said or John said <coughs> but I just want to say that you know a lot of effort did go into passing this and you know we, we discussed it you know around and around I'm not sure why the board would want to rescind an option you know it's a tool that's that's what it is it's a tool to help the people in the community now we may hear that we don't need to keep it. Beach businesses don't need it. That, you know, the beach, the ocean is there and there's enough business there to make everything go. We don't have to help those people. And that may or may not be true, but you have the option to decide that. Right? It's the uptown. It's the experience Hampton. We sit on that board and we're trying to get things going uptown. We're trying to make the two, two communities, the beach and the town, one. So I'm a little surprised that, that Phil wants to bring this forward. 
after after my dissertation on the initial, you're surprised. <laughs> well, if there's one guy on this whole board that understands the loss and the devastation of a fire or a flood or whatever we're going to have, it's the insurance guy. You know, you're you're the one that that works with these people and you understand where they're coming from. So I look at it and say, you know, this is a chance to help those people so they can get back on their feet again. Now, things are a little easier now because interest rates are low. I mean, they're, they're, they're terrific, 3 4 5%. But they won't always be there. You know, they're going to be 7 or 8 or 9% or something someday. So when we go to finance the new project, whatever that may be for whoever's building it may be, and you start to add up what it takes to tear down, remove, build up, plan again, maybe the town's help might make the difference. So I'm going to ask you to give it a chance. If you decide to vote down certain projects, fine. But think about the little guy uptown. Think about if the grocery store burned down. We're losing them everywhere. We want to be able to keep these people in town. So I just think it might be good business in the future to have the option in your toolbox. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else from the public? Seeing none. Announcements for community calendar, Mike. Uh, no, I don't have anything. Thank you. No. Uh, yes, sir, I do. I just wanted to talk about um, uh, the 79E thing. It was uh, <laughs> I received a phone call at work today, which is unusual for me to uh, get any selectman's phone calls um, about town business, and thank you for that. But uh, the patch is quoting, several big things are expected to happen at Monday night's Hampton Board of Selectmen meeting, including a motion by Selectman Phil Bean to rescind the tax relief granted to the C-spray condominiums. And, of course, that's not accurate. It's not true. We're talking about the law. The law specifically prohibits rescission of already granted relief. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to make that clarification that um, although it's on the agenda, it's not sea spray specific, it's not green company specific, and I wanted, I wanted to make that clear. Okay. And thank you very much, sir. Mike? No, no, sir. Mary Louise? Yes, I have a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I will say that I have stated publicly uh, regarding um, some of the comments earlier uh, many times that I requested and requested and requested a joint meeting with representatives of DREAD and the state to sit down and talk about the joint operation plan. The majority of the board chose not to follow through with that. But I do think it's important to sit down directly with the state and look them in the eye. Um, the other thing is that on channel 22 now in addition to the great series that uh, Director Noyes had put on there about the dams and dam reclamation uh, around the country, uh, there's a great film, and I'm not sure whether it was triggered by the 375th anniversary, Rusty May now, but Ellen Gaithel is, is uh, narrating, and you've got Harold Fernald and Eric Small from Seabrook talking about the marshes and the value of the marsh, and the marsh in the early days, God bless those people. I don't know how they ever survived with what they had to go through to do the haystacks and so things right. out in the marsh. So if you have a chance to watch that program, it, it's historic and it's delightful, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And my last comment is, having watched the zoning board meeting on the 15th, I want to give a huge round of applause, just for me personally, to the residents of St. Cyr and Falcone, for going in there and speaking up as residents in behalf of their neighborhood and doing one heck of a great job. And I hope other neighborhoods pay attention to things like that when, when projects in their neighborhood come up. Good work. Okay. Right. Mr. Thank Chen. You. Are you going to have anything you want to add in community calendar? Nope. Oh, I'd like to add something. There's something I forgot last, last week. My answer machine week, not this last week, but the week before, was on the fritz, and I know there were some calls on there, but I missed them, so if it may cares to follow up on phone calls to me on my answer machine within one week to two weeks ago, please resubmit the phone call because it's gone. Only Thank nice you. phone calls, though. <laughs> well, that's true. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. First appointment on the uh, calendar, John Nyan, Hampton Beach Area Commission, a block development. Um, I extended a invitation to John last week given the interest in the development on the A block and in particular the um, position that the uh, HVAC has taken. So you got it, John.
Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For uh, purposes of identity, uh, John Nyan, Hampton Beach Area Commission Chairperson. Um, as the chairman just mentioned, um, he had asked uh, me uh, to come in and to speak to this board with regard to the recent Beach Commission's decision to support the Green Project located at 253 and 275 Ocean Boulevard. He also thought it would be a good idea, which I agree, that it would give an opportunity for those that are watching on TV tonight, an opportunity to understand where the Beach Commission is coming from with regard to its support. So I, I thank the Chairman, I thank the Board for allowing this to happen. I think it's very important, um, although that most of you uh, know a little of the history of the Commission, I think for purposes of, once again, public information, um, if I could just take uh, a minute or so with a little bit of history. The Hampton Beach Area Commission was established in 2003, two years after the Hampton Beach Master Plan was written and approved. Present time, the Commission includes nine commissioners, two from the Town of Hampton, one from the Department of Transportation, one from DREAD, one from the Chamber of Commerce, one from Rockingham Planning Commission, and one uh, commissioner at large, two from the Hampton Beach Village District. It makes up those nine. This is, um, just so you know, this is something that I look at all the time. This is the Hampton Beach Master Plan. Uh, in here, it has a lot of documents, a lot of recommendations, a lot of assessments, if you will, on what took place in 2001 when the, the members of that commission that wrote the plan made decisions about Hampton Beach and made recommendations on Hampton Beach. The commission then was established in 2003 to work on the master plan primarily with regard to following up on the recommendations uh, of the master plan and also to take a lot of the ideas that came from the master plan and seek solutions um, and seek uh, improvements to the Hampton Beach area. One of the areas specifically was land use. Now, I want to make sure that the people in the, uh, on TV, or the people listening, because I know that you as a board knows this, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that the Hampton Beach Area Commission has no authorization on any votes that are made either by the town or the state or any um, local boards, be it planning or zoning. We have no authorization. But what we do have, based on the master plan, is an opportunity to provide an opinion, to provide a recommendation if we so fit, if, and, and if, if it's applicable to what we think is in the master plan or the interpretation of the master plan. Saying that, back in 2006, the Hampton Beach Area Commission at that time formed a subcommittee, a revitalization guidelines subcommittee of the commission. At that point, Tom McGurk was in fact uh, on the Hampton Beach Area Commission and he chaired that subcommittee. That subcommittee reviewed the master plan in detail. It spent months, so it wasn't one of these uh, report back next month type of uh, reports. But they spent months looking at the master plan and they came up with a list of recommended revitalization guidelines that we wanted to offer to the town of Hampton for their review and consideration, submitting out those recommendations and guidelines <coughs> to your building inspector uh, for future development 
or redevelopment. The handout which I attached mm -hmm. to you all tonight, I'd like to read just one paragraph. The Hampton Beach Area Commission has the goal of enhancing the substantial assets of the area. Hampton Beach should be, exper should be experienced as a clustered coastal village that provides consistently attractive and enjoyable setting for visitors and residents. It should appeal to all as a clean, comfortable place that offers high quality environment for a variety of activities and use. Its natural resources should be maintained and its economic viability should be nurtured. The purpose of this revitalization guideline report was one to stabilize and re reinforce property values to protect private and public investment. <coughs> Two, to prevent the decline of neighborhoods and business districts and upgrade building quality. Three, to preserve and reinforce the natural, historic, and architectural qualities of the neighborhoods and commercial areas. And fourth, attract development and redevelopment by establishing neighborhood and commercial conditions that make for an attractive and pleasant living and working environment. Those nine design standards include footprint slash orientation, scale, roof shape, openings, relationship to the street facade, parking and pedestrian facilities, awnings and canopy, material colors, and signs. These guidelines were adopted by the Hampton Beach Area Commission in 2007 and submitted in for use once again to your building inspector to be able to pass out to building developers and anybody interested in either building or redeveloping mm -hmm. uh, facilities, buildings down on Hampton Beach. Since 2007, the Hampton Beach Area Commission has had requests by developers to sit down with us so that they could show us what they were planning to do and for us then to comment, noting that this was not something that they were required to do, they were asked to do. In all instances, when a request was made to the Hampton Beach Area Commission, for a sit-down meeting, we did. There were some projects along the beach that did not come to us. They were developed and some were not developed. But every instance where somebody requested a meeting with the Beach Commission, we made that happen. One of which developers that came to us was the Green and Company. They've come to us three times now. The first is the Sea Spray. The second was the Shirley. And now the A Block. So like our tradition and our past, we requested a meeting uh, with the Green and Company to explore, to review, and to comment on their project. So on mo Monday, August 12th, in a publicly advertised meeting, the subcommittee of the Hampton Beach Area Commission, which consisted of myself, Bob Preston, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, and Chuck Rage from the Hampton Beach Village District. That meeting took place on August 12th at the Green and Company's uh, corporate headquarters in Northampton. And we spent close to an hour and a half in that meeting. And as you all know, Nick Reed from the Hampton Union was there because you saw an article shortly after that. I can assure you that during that hour and a half, we asked a lot of questions, made a lot of comments, and made a lot of suggestions. At the end of that meeting, it was decided by the subcommittee and then subsequently endorsed by the majority of the Hampton Beach Area Commissioners to support this project. 
A letter was written to Mr. Robert Viclasad on that date, basically saying, on behalf of the Hampton Area Beach Commission, I am writing this letter to indicate our support of the proposed development project 253-275 Ocean Boulevard. You all have that letter of support. It outlines the, the nine areas in which we looked at during that meeting. It also identified that two of those nine areas really were not applicable, signs and awnings and canopy, so we eliminated those from our review. During the meeting, we discussed the other seven standards and felt that six of the seven quickly met our design standards, along with complying with the Hampton Beach Master Plan. This proposal showed that they took into consideration the master plan recommendations around mixed use of building, commercial and residential. It showed a roof shape that was being consistent with some of their other projects that wasn't your square box looking building. It had a relationship of the street facade matching the rest of A block. The proposed building col colors was consistent with expectations. And finally, their parking and pedestrian facilities, openings and footprint and orientation requirements appeared to meet the master plan and town standards. Being only one of the seven applicable design standards, height, let's talk about height. We realize that that was a very sensitive area, a standard for us to really review. We thought it was important to have a lot of discussion, which we did. Why so high? The answers that we were given was that the cost of the property, which is probably one of the most expensive properties on the beach, <coughs> cost of construction requires mass and scale to make it financially work. We asked questions on or about the height, the total living space versus the total height. And we, yes, we understood that when you add not only the, the living space, but some of the architectural design of the roofing that we would like to see and that building was a little under 100 feet, approximately 99.8, I believe it was. If they proposed a height as a box, if you will, you would bring it down probably around 10 to 12 feet. But one of our standards, once again, is the roofing and the scale of the roofing. We asked about because this was important to the Commission. We had publicly stated uh, to this board and in public that the Hampton Beach Area Commission was willing and uh, working with the Planning Board to look at a warrant article for next March with regard to reviewing the height standards along Hampton Beach, especially in the commercial side of Havel Street all the way down to Ashworth Avenue. <coughs> and that was sensitive to us because I had made a commitment to this chairman that the Beach Commission would look into that and would work with the Planning Board to cover that. The answer that we were given was that this particular agreement to purchase is time sensitive and would expire way before the next March town meeting. In this review, in this discussion, keep in mind, once again, we were not decision makers. We were just listeners and individuals that could give an opinion. We had to take the Green and Company for what they have told us in terms of cost, in terms of the ex expiration of the purchase of agreement, etc. In addition, 
I would like to add some additional comments that came into play with our opinion uh, to support this project. And if I may ask Channel 22 to put this picture up on the TV so people at home could see it. And I apologize. Um, I only have four copies, so I would ask one select person to, to share. Yeah. Do they have it yet, John? Yes, they oh, do. Okay. They do. Yeah. Okay. Members of the board, Thank you, sir. this picture, this is what we have looked at for the last three years down in Hampton Beach. Based on the selling prices that our two, those two owners that own the property are looking for, what would be the likelihood to find another developer willing to invest in this project? Assuming that we can't, for a while, do what we want to continue in terms of looking for property, this piece of property right now, in my opinion, as a resident of Hampton, in my opinion, is a major eyesore. And where through its cash, parking transactions contribute only $34,000 in terms of tax revenue, estimated tax revenue to the town of Hampton. Or do we consider one project utilizing the entire property and once again would contribute close to $500,000 in estimated tax revenues? The mixed use of adding eight high-scale retail stores was very important to us. This is what I think Mitchells <coughs> was looking for as partners of the A Block, my opinion. We need upscale commercial retail stores, not the ones that you see on B Street, on B Block. Those retail stores are not the retail stores that we want on Hampton Beach. They're not conducive to our families. They're not conducive to children. We need some assurances, and we would, which we were received by the Green Company, that the retail stores, those eight retail stores, would be upscale and that would have covenants stopping any retailer to come in to sell anything that would be consistent to the B Block. The Contel concept. You know, one of the things that the Beach Commission has listened to is the thought process of, do we need more hotel rooms? That block would be perfect, people have said, for somebody to come in and build a year-round hotel. Well, in my opinion, I would disagree with that. If we can't get the Ashworth Hotel to stay open year-round, I doubt very much if we could get a hotel on Ocean Boulevard that would be brand new to stay open year-round. So what do we do? My opinion, we, we would start enhancing and looking at existing properties where we possibly could add hotel rooms to those existing properties. And in this particular case, we have 56 units that could be rented, not on a weekly or monthly basis, but on a daily basis. Present use, one could say that the present use as parking lots at their high rates hurts the beach rather than helps. July 4th, 2013, parking lot that's in this property was charging $50 for parking, $50. That is not conducive to bringing families down to Hampton Beach. Finally, in our support, we realize that we're asking the zoning board to make an exception and also goes against what was originally recommended regarding scale by our own commission. <coughs> and the only thing I can say to you, members of the board, is the beach is changing. And a lot of things that were written and talked about in 2001 is different in 2013. 
We wish we had a better solution for this premier property, but we don't. And we don't see anyone coming forward with a better solution, keeping within the height restriction because of the cost of the properties. We also realize that this block would only be feasible, this project can only be feasible on the A block. The Beach Commission, the subcommittee, has already made comment, made it publicly known that we would not support this type of project in any other block on Hampton Beach. However, this block, we feel that it's feasible. We also realize that the height is a standard that really needs to be revisited. And as I said earlier, the Beach Commission is prepared to do that and work with the Planning Board. So therefore, let me just make sure that you know the last paragraph of my letter to Chairman Lassad. We would ask you and the Board to work with Mr. Green and his variance request and to come up with a joint solution so that we may continue to see economic development progress throughout the beach area. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Um, anybody from the board have any questions or comments? Or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Nobody else wants to volunteer. I will. Um, I'm not prepared to have this community held hostage to the needs of the developers. Um, I think that you can perhaps relate to the old saying, uh, act in haste, repent at leisure. Uh, I had to chuckle because when Mr. Rage, who's done a very nice proposal on his property at 119 Ocean Boulevard, was in before the planning board, he was asked about the retail units on the first floor and whether there could be any upscale retail, whatever, and he chuckled and said basically he'd take what he could get. Portsmouth is in the process of lowering height restrictions. And I was interested, because we do have a copy of your letter to Mr. Lassard, and I'm looking at your nine uh, design standards, but I notice after having served on the planning board with the 339-345 proposal that I see one absolutely critical area missing from those uh, standards and that is access for fire apparatus and that was a big issue and still is in my mind for the 339-345 project. Um, I think it is um, in, in my opinion it is premature for the Hampton Beach Area Commission which is neither elected uh, nor charged with any responsibility other than the generic responsibility <coughs> that you have for making the master plan to jump in even before the zoning board has had a chance to take a look at the property. Um, quite frankly, the zoning, the height of buildings by ordinance now, we do have ordinances in this community, uh, the height uh, is restricted to 50 feet. doesn't matter how old it is or when the vote was taken, that's the the um, stipulation. Uh, one thing that I had to chuckle at when Charlie Preston was talking, and I absolutely agree with him, when I see a plan like the one that's being proposed by Green and Company, uh, right here for the 253-275 Ocean Boulevard, I have a mental picture of toilets, showers, sinks, washing machines, water, 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 effluent going into our already chancy wastewater treatment plant. And I will say at this point in time that whether it takes a year or ten years, rather than throw something in there because somebody wants to build it, I want to see us take the time and not inflict developments on this town and this beach that are going to be damaging in the long run. There you go. That's Anybody it. else on the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks, John, for you know giving us a nice uh, presentation. I just <clears throat> I have a couple of concerns, and they're relatively brief and minor in relation to uh, some other things. Um, I look at the Hampton Beach Area Commission as a uh, commission that should be looking at what we can do to get the Hampton Beach moving in a good direction. I don't look at it as a 
vehicle for a construction company to use. Mm -hmm. Now, that, putting that aside, putting that aside, if the Hampton Beach Area Commission wants or thinks that 50 feet or 100 feet or 1,000 feet is appropriate for the beach, my feeling, and I'm not an expert on all this stuff with the Hampton Beach Area Commission, but I think it would be part of our approach to have the legislative body look at what's available, give them choices, do they want 50 feet, 100 feet, or whatever, and let the legislative body decide. That's the way the last ordinance was approved, from my understanding. And I, if we're going to work on the master plan, which it, it looks like to me the Hampton Beach Area Commission was looking at the Hampton Beach master plan back in those days, as we might say, I think it's their duty to move the community towards the direction we all think we're going to go. Meaning that going just to the zoning board, have the zoning board members, a handful of people, decide what's good for Hampton, I think is questionable at the very least. And on the worst case, I think it's ridiculous, okay? But asking the zoning board to deliberately violate the rules I think it's just plain wrong. Absolutely. And that's the way I felt when we looked at this thing the last time, that <clears throat> they seem to put all the rules aside and say, well, let's let them build a, as tall as they want to and hope for the best. Well, if I was the developer in the Greens case, and I'm not going to say they do this, but if I was Green, I'd say, well, let's see. We pushed the limit here, and we got by with it. We're pushing a little more here, and we're getting by with it. Let's go for a little bit more and see if we can get by with that one, too. That's the way it looks to me. <coughs> Simple, everyday logic. If you let me get by with this, I'm going to get by with that, and eventually I'm going to get by with the whole damn thing. What is it you want, okay? So I, I feel very s strong about this. I think that the Hampton Beach Area <coughs> Commission, in my opinion, was wrong to endorse this in any way, shape, or form. That's the way I feel. And I think for the zoning board, and they're another elected body, and I'm not going to speak one way or the other about the zoning board, but the zoning board, in my opinion, should not be a, a small group of people who decide what's good for Hampton when the legislative body, which are called the voters, and the taxpayers that pay for all of our foolishness, <laughs> they should have a say in this. I'm very strong about the taxpayers. That's why I even ran for the budget committee in the beginning, because I thought the taxpayers were being abused. This and the green companies plan right now. I know that this lot looks pretty sad. I won't argue with that. But it's a prime piece of real estate. And uh, I can't believe that there's nothing else available for that piece of property. Yeah. Now, their plan might be beautiful. It might answer everybody's questions and might even answer all the problems that everybody has, but I don't know. It looks like to me that it wouldn't take much to make that go unless, of course, the sellers are asking a lot of money. If they're asking for a lot of money, the marketplace will decide that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not uh, the least bit enthused about the way this has been handled. Putting that aside, good luck with <coughs> Green & Company. Okay. That's Bill? all I have to say. Bill, Mike. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I would like to um, ask a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I applaud the uh, uh, grassroots uh, going through the uh, precinct, the Hampton Beach Area Commission. <coughs> I, I think that's important. I think that's an important first step. And I applaud the Green Company for for getting out in front of that issue. Uh, uh, I've got a couple of questions. How much bigger is this project, John, than um, the Sea Spray? You have it's a total tax value, if you know. Yeah, I do. Is it twice as big? Is it? I have that number right here for you. Okay. Tax value is um, the C spray. The estimated tax revenue is two hundred fourteen thousand dollars. Was that without seventy nine? 
That is with that's without se without seven ninety. Yep. Yeah. Without and that, that that was at the completed structure. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. The thirty the three thirty nine Ocean Boulevard was an estimated two hundred forty one thousand. Okay. And that's and the two seventy five the project we're talking about tonight is an estimated five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. So the three three projects total is. Uh, Almost a million dollars in Wonderful. estimated you. tax revenue. Uh, in your discussions, uh, in your your charrettes, I think as they call them today, um, have you discussed with the green company if they'll be seeking relief under 7090 as it is now written <laughs> and approved by the town of That subject was not brought up, and it's not my understanding that they will be. Uh, it's my understanding that they will not be, but I, I cannot tell you uh, for sure. Um, but I can tell you for sure that they are fully aware that that application would have to come to this board. Wonderful. And 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 having been down this this road just a few short months ago with their just now former project um, that is I guess underway or going to be underway, um, I think it's great that you are out in front and and uh, and, and doing this this leg work and, and a little bit different view than Mike and Mike has his opinion on the project. But I think it's important to do this, and I think along with that is the, the planning and, uh, um, of course, that the planning board's going to do in working with code and working with fire, public <coughs> works, and the issues Mary Louise addresses. Uh, equally important, I think the board here needs to make sure that we have a negotiation phase uh, because we were headed down another track on the last project. And it was not involved in negotiation, and it was heading towards uh, a, a building where a man or woman wears a black robe, and I don't think uh, that is the best interest of the town, and I don't think that's visionary, and I don't think that's pro-business, and I think we as a board um, need to, to look at what steps we're doing in conjunction with this effort. I think it's a ringing endorsement of the beach. I think it's a ringing endorsement of the $50 million Hampton taxpayers have put forth in, in non-infrastructure and infrastructure projects to support the state's $20 million. And I think it's great the Green Company comes in on the, on the back of that $79 million taxpayer um, burden that's already been paid in the last 15 years to develop this. And I want to make sure that, that we as selectmen uh, go slow and that we do have a, a process for negotiation and a full incorporation of, of this type of effort and not be marching off um, to, to, uh, to court, if you will. Um, and I, I, I want to I really emphasize that. And I'm really, really... Uh, going to be focused on that. And I think that's important. And I think that to do otherwise is not to be visionary and is not to uh, support the business climate and does send the wrong message. And I, and I really want people to get around the table on it, including this board. And that board of uh, adjustment and the zoning board, they, they are their own boards. And uh, I'm not one to follow that, that stuff um, closely. And I know others on the board are, and that's their right. Um, it's not what, the way I look at the world, but I, I do applaud you tonight. And uh, I think the Green Company is a great company. And I think that beach is undervalued. And I think it's great real estate. And you can go to beaches anywhere around the world, and that beach stacks up. And uh, uh, I say welcome aboard, and let's all work together. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mike? I, th I think that this is a great discussion. But we asked the public to raise the height from 35 to 50. Mm -hmm. And they voted for that took a couple of years, but, but they voted for it. They understood that there was some change needed at the beach. And that's good. But to go from 50 feet to almost 100 feet without permission, I think, is wrong. And I would hate to see this built and five years down the road have somebody in here saying, we don't see the sun until lunchtime because we're on Ashworth Avenue behind this proposal. And then you're going to have the beach people in there in the afternoon that are out on the beach and they're going to discuss shadows and not so much sun up there because it's headed down the other side. This lot went through a tremendous fire and it's been there vacant for a number of years. And I think that the public in this town should have a chance mm -hmm. to go back to the polls and vote 
that they either want to go to 100 feet, they don't want to go to 100 feet, they want to stay at 50. I, th I think there's a great discussion out there of people who want it 100 feet, and I think there's a great discussion out there of people who don't. Maybe there's a compromise that we need to discuss. I don't know. But I would hate to see this passed in a rush mm. and then have this community suffer with mm -hmm. the result for a long, long time. And I think we need to go slow, we need to talk about it, we need to involve the whole community. Through t if, if the process is through town meeting, then that's where it should go. Okay. Um, John, I think you pretty much from my email um, know what my feelings are, and I won't repeat all that, but I will hit a few of the, the highlights. Um, the first thing is, is personally, I don't have a, a problem with buildings that are 75 feet versus 50 feet. I'm not sure about 100, haven't given it that much thought or whatever, but, but I, I don't have an issue um, with that right off the bat. Um, what I have a concern with is pretty much what's already been expressed is the fact that the, the, the legislative body has been mm -hmm. cut out in the loop, okay, and on two levels. On one level, 100 feet versus 50 feet. I didn't bat an eyelash when, when, when the sea spray went through it, 60 feet or whatever, and the architectural appurtenances and all that. It, 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 it made sense, and I, I didn't see that as a, a controversial issue. But going to 100 feet, but coupled with the fact that we have had three approved in a very short period of time, and the accumulative impact of those three, um, in my email, I, I suggested that it was probably going, going to be combining the three, about 150 new property owners. I think it's closer to 135 or 137 <laughs> new property owners. Just to put that in perspective, what, what do 135 properties mean? There are only 75 properties on Ocean Boulevard from 1st Street to 19th Street on Ocean Boulevard, mm -hmm. okay? So this is literally close to double. I went a little bit further after I sent you the email, okay? From one Ocean Boulevard to the Ashworth Hotel, there were only 153 properties, okay? And that includes referring to the, the casino, 169 Ocean Boulevard, which is a whole mm -hmm. number of individual condos or whatever. I'm not counting that as one. I'm counting all those individual properties. So the accumulative impact of these three, okay, is, is just absolutely huge to take place in such a short period of time without the approval of the legislative body. What we essentially have is, is de facto land use planning by zoning variance, yes. okay? Yes. And, and that's, you know, the Not zoning simple. board just by nature, it's their job, is transactional. It's one property at a time. But should this one be approved, the combination of the three is literally double the properties in North Beach and similar to the amount from, from the start of Ocean Boulevard to, to, to the Ashworth. Um, and I think that's reflected in some of the comments. I think the zoning board understands that. I think that there's some frustration on the part of a lot of people with the ordinance the way it is. And I, I again, I, I don't have a problem with whether or not this property is, is good or bad. I see a lot more good in it. And I have a bias towards the taxpayer. And I see that, that all three of these are, are actually going to help the taxpayer quite a bit. I have no argument with that. But we're an SB2 community. And 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 the 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 nature of an SB2 community is is the voters are supposed to be mm -hmm. able to weigh in on major things and the combination of the three, um, you know they're they're not able to and what we've essentially got and I'm not sure the exact number but we've got seven or ten or twelve people when, when you you know a couple of people from the HBAC look at it make a recommendation the zoning board approves it and it's pretty much it it might get shifted around a little bit in terms of some of the particulars by the planning board. Um, the final thing that I'll, I'll mention is is I've got kind of a little bit of a history with, with beaches and going through change. I grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts. My hangout as a kid was Nantasket Beach in Hull. Um, most of my relatives came from Winthrop, Mass. And as a kid, I remember going to Revere Beach. I remember when the cyclone was there and whatever. And, and I've seen those change. And, and, and I did a little bit of Googling today, and I thought this was, was very interesting. And I hit looking to see if I could figure out what was going on with some of those others. And I'll just 
read an article from the Patriot Ledger, and this is something that's taken place just in the last two to three months. May I, um, Mr. Chairman? I used to deliver that paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and this is basically what's going on in, in the town of Hull, which is where Nantasket Beach is, is located. Town officials say they will ask voters to accept a plan that could revitalize a part of Nantasket Beach plagued by empty storefronts and undeveloped lots. Hull officials have held a flurry of meetings in recent weeks as they put the final touches on zoning changes designed to attract developers and create new spaces for business and organizations. The proposal, which is expected to go before town meeting in May, covers 64 acres. The latest proposal would create an alternative set of rules that would cover the entire area and allow buildings to be taller, up to five stories, if certain conditions are met. This one, as I understand it, is an eight-story building. The town staff have spent the last two months updating the proposal to address concerns raised by residents at a public meeting in November about parking and traffic and yes. building heights and whatever. He said the latest version cuts the maximum building height by a full story and includes plans to mitigate any traffic created by the new developments. This proposal was, was passed by town meeting by a two-thirds vote in May. Um, that is my issue. It's not whether 75, 100 feet are good or bad. I'm pre predisposed to think they're good. I'm predisposed to... I've got a bias that, that I think that these are, are going to be a net benefit to Hampton. But we're an SB2 town. And, and something this big, the voters deserve a chance. So that's my input. But I do appreciate all the effort Richard, that you put into it. Me. One, one quick final thought. With all due respect to my colleague, Mr. Bean, um, that picture of the person in the black robe um, is motivating. Sometimes the only way you get the donkey to move is to wave the carrot on the stick. And in the long run, develop development of any kind in the long run is a double-edged sword. May I, Mr. Chairman, I just want to add Okay, one. let's just bear in mind that That's we've it. got a very... Yeah. We're in trouble on the agenda, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to express to the audience and the people here and the uh, watching that uh, 22, I personally don't have a problem with tall buildings at Hampton Beach. It means I don't go down much to the summertime because I'm not too fond of crowds. I go down in the wintertime to enjoy the ocean. The buildings behind me are almost academic from that point of view. All I can tell you is I moved here in 1963 and I watched Revere Beach go from a family-oriented amusement park beach to tall condos and nothing else. Yeah. All the little businesses we now enjoy down at the beach, all the little ones that we all are familiar with, mm -hmm. they're all gone. Yeah. They're absolutely gone at Revere Beach. And not that I dislike the bare condos and steel going up straight and nothing but ocean, because I wasn't overly fond of all the amusement park to start with. But it's gone. If we want to change from big condos to beach, like Revere Beach, and eliminate all the small businesses we have down at the beach, this is the way to go. Let them build them. That's all I have to say. I have nothing against big buildings. I just think that I think it's the wrong way to go, and I think as an SB2 town, the voters should have some say in it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I just sure. make a closing remark yep. based on some of the additional remarks? First, first of all, I just need to clarify that it was a mutual agreement between the town of Hampton and the Beach Commission back in 2007 for the town to ask us to put some guidelines together. Um, based on what we thought was the Beach Commission, and that was why that subcommittee was uh, established, and that was why Tommy McGurk and others mm -hmm. put this report together. So it was kind of a mutual understanding between the town and them. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. But the most important thing, and, and, and this is what makes living in the United States so great. First of all, as we saw in the zoning board mm -hmm. uh, meeting last week, mm -hmm. a group of individuals great. came forward and uh, basically shut down a, a very large apartment complex. Mm, good. People spoke out. The zoning board listened. There are many people watching tonight's meeting 
and whether or not they agree with me, mm -hmm. or they agree with this board. Yep. They're being educated and they're learning. Yep. This okay. Thursday night is an opportunity for yep. anybody to come out and speak either pro or con about this. But I, but I think it's important that we realize and recognize that with freedom of speech for either an individual, mm -hmm. a group, an organization, a board is very, very important. And so that although I respect your, your opinions, I would hope that you would respect the yep. Beach Commission's opinions also. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Okay. Next appointment on the agenda, Chris <laughs> Silver, Fire Chief, with half a dozen items, and I would just ask that we all be cognizant of what's left and what time it is, and I'm sure that won't bother the Chief. <laughs> He's tough. Well, if I'd known we were going to go this late, I would have prepared the motions for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I'd be happy to entertain a yes vote. <laughs> um, you know what I'll do? I'll, uh, I'll just really condense departmental update. I just want to highlight a couple of things uh, and really recognition of the efforts of, uh, of our firefighters over the past few months. Uh, many of you know that our firefighters participated in a program at Center School. It's called FAST, Firefighters and Students Together. Very successful program. Uh, our members truly enjoy spending a, a day a week in the school working with the students, working on leadership issues and team building issues with these kids. And uh, at, at the end of the school year, we, do, uh, we participate in their field day with them. And, and everybody really enjoys it. They have a lot of fun doing it. Um, two events that they also participate in over the summer. One is the, their, their, um, their fundraising events, their boot drives, where they, uh, where they collect money. Uh, they recently did one for the Byrne Foundation, and I'm sure you're all aware, and I just want to recognize mm -hmm. them once again for their efforts. And this year was the first time they were ever able to return some of that money locally to a, okay. uh, a local yes, resident yeah. who, had, uh, who had been seriously burned. Uh, later on on your agenda, probably on the consent agenda, you'll see there's uh, another one that's coming up, mm -hmm. and I hope you'll support yeah. that as well. Um, they also, once again, hosted the annual Strawberry Festival at Station 2, although it was a little bit more of a challenge this year for a couple of reasons. Construction at the station, and it was an extremely hot day that day. It uh, was a good turnout, and you know, regardless of the turnout, our members really do care about the community. Um, last point, I really want to recognize a couple of individuals. On July 25th, Firefighter Jed Carpentier, Firefighter Paramedic Kyle Jamison, and Police Officer Jim DeLuca, uh, entered Hampton Beach, swam out uh, a little over 200 yards to two swimmers who were in distress, were able to reach both of those swimmers, stay with them, keep them afloat until Marine One, leaving from the pier, was able to circle around, pick them up, and return everybody safely to, uh, to the uh, public safety pier. Um, they really deserve uh, quite a bit of credit because it's certainly no easy undertaking swimming out in, in, the, uh, in the ocean. Um, fire station update. Fire stations are, are progressing very, very well. Winnicunit Road is nearing completion on the new construction. Uh, throughout the past nine months, they have been able to uh, also perform some of the work on the renovation in the existing part of the building. Uh, everything they can do as long as we were still occupying the space. You know, a couple of things that uh, I had added to the project because I, I felt very strongly that they were needed. Um, all the new part of the building had to be sprinkled. We extended sprinklers over to all of the existing building as well. Um, same thing with the fire alarm system. You know, all new fire alarm system. Uh, what we had for fire alarm system just was you know, really an old, outdated system. So it makes, the, uh, it makes the building much more safer for occupancy. Um, the, uh, the spaces, the grounds, everything is coming along very nicely. I expect that we should probably be able to move in to Winnicott Road um, maybe four weeks. Wow. Uh, the station at the beach, if you've been driving by recently, you see that it's really starting to shape up very nicely. I'm looking forward to <coughs> them getting the siding on because I think once you get the siding on, it's really, you're going to see the, the true character of the mm. building uh, as, it will, uh, as it will sit finished. <coughs> um, for a long time, you know, I looked at the way the building was was sitting, and we uh, we elevated it quite a bit because it's in a coastal flood zone. 
and I was looking at the road and I was looking at the apparatus ramp and I was just trying to picture how that was going to match up and I just couldn't see it until we put that binder coat of asphalt down and everything just flowed together nicely so it's it's really coming along very very well um, though we did we did run into a few bumps along the way and we did slow down a little bit uh, I think they've gained a lot of momentum back and right now we're expecting that will be completed probably by mid to late October so once we're done with the construction there, we get a certificate of occupancy, we'll be able to move the last few people out of the existing beach station. Once we're out of there, we'll be able to raise that building, raise the old precinct garage, and we want to get all the asphalt done before November yeah. so that we're still able to complete that project uh, on time. Um, I did provide for you several pieces of information. I'll just kind of go through along as we, as we um, uh, progress through this agenda. There is a packet. Uh, it's just the year-to-date EMS statistics. I'm not even going to review those just in the interest of time, but you do have those, and you can review those at your leisure. Uh, I will send to you at a later date. I just wasn't able to produce them in a, in a meaningful format, the year-to-date fire statistics, so I will get those to you later. Uh, questions about department operations, questions about what's going on, questions about the fire stations? Yeah, a couple of real quick um, questions. You've given us the uh, the EMS information here. Um, are we back on track on the uh, ambulance run billings? I, it looked like they might have been running a little bit processing ambulance runs. They always do. They always run about f about four to five weeks behind. So that's not exciting. Not really. No. Processing ambulance runs. Okay. No, and, and a lot of that is, uh, it, it's just the whole process of the way the paperwork comes in, the way it gets built, mm -hmm. and then the way the funds actually come into the okay. town. So, so by the time you put all those pieces there's together. There's nothing outstanding and no, not as far unusual as, on that. As far as our processing of them, yeah. this year tends to be a little bit busier, so the volume increases. Okay. Um, I'd say at most maybe we're 10 days or 14 days okay. lagging. Um, can can I real really quickly can I touch on the pumpers since I had asked about that and I that's had, a, had a chance to that is the that next uh, let's see if there's any other questions that's the next item yeah. on the agenda uh, yeah I, I have a couple uh, uh, being the precinct rep for the village district rep I'm sure they're going to be anxious to know when they can move in if their building is <laughs> going to be leveled can you anticipate that somewhere around October November time frame roughly mm -hmm. what do you mean move in <laughs> new t into their new spacious quarters they, on the second um, floor. <laughs> the the meeting room on the second floor will be accessible as soon as we have a certificate of occupancy for the building. Hmm. So I expect that probably about October. Um, as part of that meeting room, there's also a uh, storage closet, a restroom, and a small like a kitchenette area hmm. that will uh, serve that meeting area. Oh, nice. And that's somewhere around October, November time frame, roughly. That's correct, yes. And so how soon are we going to level the old building? And I mean, how soon quick, how as we walk out and <laughs> turn the lights off, there will well, be an excavator there to start ooh, tearing The reason why I ask is because the village district commissioners may not walk as fast as you. <laughs> <laughs> if we need to help them get across the parking lot, we'll, uh, we'll make sure they get all of there this There you stuff. go. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions? No, oh, not now, thanks. I just got one, hopefully simple one, Chief. Roughly how long does it take or did it take to respond with the boat to a situation like the, the rescue that took place that you described? In time or? Time, yeah. Uh, and, and assuming there's no extraordinary okay. circumstances with traffic. Sure. Yep. All right, so uh, let me, um, there's, there's several pieces of the way we tier the response. So uh, we have a minimum number of people that will send the boat on a rescue mission. That minimum number is four. There are only three members assigned at the beach. Mm. So the way we augment that is we have the ambulance from Winnicunit Road mm -hmm. respond down, yeah. and one member gets on board, so they have the minimum of four. Uh, what we've done is we've modified that because the boat couldn't deploy until mm. that fourth member arrives. So now what we do instead is we take that first engine company, we send them directly to the water's edge, closest to the scene. And in this case, that's why two rescue swimmers were able to immediately enter the water. Yeah. In the meantime, 
the engine company and the ambulance from Winnicunna Road will respond down, staff the boat, one member will remain with the ambulance and then go to the water's edge. So the, uh, the time for response, vehicle driving from Winnicunna Road to the pier is approximately three to four minutes. Uh, by the time they deploy and they circle around the end of the jetty, depends on which area of the main right. beach, mm -hmm. it could be another five to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So in total, we're, I'm going to estimate uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Wow. Okay. Thanks. The pumper. Actually, you just asked a good question, which is a lead-in for what I discussed with you a little bit ago. Let's not forget where we're at in the agenda. I know, but this, this is important, in light, of, especially in light of what the chief just said. I have discussed with the town manager and with the chairman uh, a, my thought in going before the state representatives on the 29th when they're in here taking uh, information on proposed legislation and so forth because of the jetty. Now, the state has finally posted a sign, which is years overdue, warning people <coughs> about that jetty. But uh, I had asked Fred, why don't they have a little thing on the bottom saying violators will be prosecuted under whatever. And Fred informed me that DREAD has no enforcement authority whatsoever. So I am... Um, a regular rescue is one thing if somebody gets caught in a riptide and they're swimming or they cut their foot on glass. But for people to go out on that jetty deliberately, especially now that the warning sign is up, then we have to rescue them. I want to see a sign up down there. However, we have to do it. And we're going to talk to the state reps about the possibility of piggybacking with fish and game, because I guess they're the only ones <coughs> who have the authority to do this, to say to people, if you go out there on that jetty after having been warned by the state of New Hampshire, if we rescue you, and unfortunately I'd like to say too bad you can swim over to England, but that's not going to happen because I know police and fire will respond. But we're risking the lives of first responders doing rescues like that. I want to be able to say to potential violators, if we have to rescue you because you were dumb enough to go out on that jetty, we are going to charge you for the whole thing, for the boat, for the responders, for the overtime, for the callback, whatever. So, just as an, uh, well, okay. I, that, I think that it's... I think is a so that's complicated issue for a right. future yeah. discussion. But we the, the next item on the agenda is the pumper. And just, Chris, just so you know the background information, as you know, you've had that in the... Um, CIP at 585,000 for 2015 for mm -hmm. um, I would say at least two or three years it's been at that that um, that year 2015. 2015. Mary Louise had had um, proposed last week moving that into 2014 and after a short um, truncated discussion we decided that was a discussion that was more appropriate to have. Yeah. Um, when you were here, so that's basically. And I talked where we're to the at. chief today at the meeting because I was at the meeting on on uh, the ocean rising and climate change, et cetera, and the chief was there as well. My question to him, basically, because we're talking about a 1988 pumper, and my question to him was, assuming that we put this on a uh, warrant article uh, under a five-year note for a payback in March 2014, with everything uh, settling wonderfully in place, how soon could we actually get that piece of apparatus here on scene so that we'd have it to use? Go for it. I actually called the manufacturer today just to confirm what I thought. Mm -hmm. And the minimum build time for a fire pumper now is seven and a half to eight months. Build time. That's correct. That's important. And uh, when you add in the additional prep time and bidding time, he said typically the whole start to finish process takes about 12 months. Yeah. And now we're talking pushing forward into 2015. And if we leave it on the CIP for 2015, you're looking at 2016. And it's a 1988 pumper. And you might as well tell the public, hey, fellas, we've only got three pumpers running. And the pumper is the thing that comes to your house and squirts the water on the fire. I still say we need to move that into 2014. We're going to have to do it. Might as well bite the bullet and do it now. Mr. Chairman, may I ask the Chief a couple of questions sure. after we get done listening to Ms. Uh, Mary Louise's presentation? <laughs> um, the 1988, is it as bad off as some of these old people at this board? 
Um, it is it is by far our oldest piece. It should have been replaced years ago. It does uh. not meet uh, motor vehicle safety standards. The cost of maintenance is increasing as it is our oldest pumper. Um, it it uh, it is maintaining a reserve status. The reason why it has not yet been replaced is because newer, more modern apparatus are larger, of course. Yes. And we have not had the space. Mm. So until we had fire stations approved, we really had no way to house an, an additional new pumper. So uh, in my mind, the logic was let's wait until the fire stations are approved and completed. Um, I had hoped, and the reason why I picked 2015 is because in 2013, I had also asked for a warrant article for a capital reserve mm -hmm. account. So had that been approved, we would have had some money in that account, and it would have lessened the cost. So I thought, build that account for a couple of years, and then <coughs> go after the pumper. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had uh, I'd put it on in, on 2015. So okay. by supporting the two new fire stations, I end up costing the taxpayers by <laughs> forcing new pumpers on them. Okay. I understand. What we're, we're, we're talking about. No, I'm sorry. I didn't finish, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to get a flavor on the 1988. So it's not up to vehicle standards as far as safety, but what about can it pump water and actually do its function? It barely passed its pump test this year. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Send it to Hedman Ave. Poor Mike. I'm all set. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any other questions or comments or whatever? Not on that. I would make um, I would make two. If the pumper were to be moved in a 2014 and purchased outright, as the last one was, well, we could do um, that too. let me continue, Mary Louise. Okay. Um, it would increase the municipal tax rate from what is now an 8 percent increase to an 11 percent increase. If we were to finance it over a five-year period, as Mary Louise had suggested, we would add. Um, 62000 um, in interest expense, and I assumed what I thought was a fairly reasonable interest rate at 3.5%. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the facts. Um, it's now sitting in the CIP at 2015. My suggestion, Mary Louise, if mm -hmm. you would like to move that to 2014, make a motion, get a second, let's take a vote, and wherever it lands, it lands. I will so move. Uh, and the move it into 2014 on the basis of spreading another five-year note. Second the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Pearson Nichols opposed. It passes um, <coughs> three to two. Um, I will move it into the 2014 CIP. Um, it di I recognize that it did pass with a five-year time frame, but I would suggest that have a little bit further um, mm -hmm. discussion with the finance yeah. director and we have plenty of time yeah, that's okay. on the right. finance. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a point of clarification for me. Does the vote of the board tonight um, indicate that it will be a warrant it, article? It, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, absolutely. Uh, that's important for me to know because that means I need to start working yep. on that now. Yep. Oh, we didn't mean to give you any extra No work point in putting it in the 2014 <laughs> CIP and not, not having planning a warrant on article. a warrant right. article. Right. Right. Otherwise yeah. it would be a okay. new yeah. Motion. Okay. All right. Um, Next Chris, item. you had asked that we put this item <coughs> on the agenda, the ambulance purchase bid update. I think you were looking for a, a waiver of sorts yeah, or whatever. Uh, I, I think it may. I'm not sure if this requires a waiver. Um, we had uh, we put this out for sealed bid in 2012, and I received uh, several qualified bids. Um, we, w we began the process of negotiation with who we yeah. thought would be the successful bidder. Mm -hmm. And through the negotiation, we realized that there were numerous flaws in their submission of the specification. And as we began correcting those, it was adding cost. It finally got to a point where I wasn't comfortable with the change in the cost. Mm -hmm. And I discussed it with the manager. We felt so much time had passed, it was in the best interest to rebid. So in January of 2013, we rebid for the replacement of an ambulance. We received uh, an appropriate number of successful bids. <laughs> uh, I selected one, began the negotiation, and uh, a week ago they withdraw their, their proposal. Oh, so uh, I, what, I, what I observed when we went back to bid is the prices didn't stay the same. The prices went up. Mm, yeah. uh, I still do have 
one valid proposal. It is by Minuteman Fire and Rescue Apparatus Incorporated. Um, I did ask them to provide a current proposal. I did uh, just hand that out to you. It is at one seventy-five six hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. It is right in line with the other two uh, acceptable yeah. bids that we had with no price increase and it changed from a 2013 to a 2014 chassis. Okay. So I, I would ask your permission yeah. to begin negotiating a final contract with Minuteman Fire Rescue Apparatus. Also move to allow the chief uh, so to let waive. Let me the ask it just from a protocol. So you would plan on coming back again once you had the final um, amount or? I, I think that that's He's probably the final amount, 175, 614. Okay. The only point I want to make is in, in terms of the purchasing policy, um, anything over $50,000 mm -hmm. needs to be approved um, by the board. So if he's asking for that approval at this point, then I think that would do it. What was the range? You mentioned the price with Minuteman, 175, 614. Yeah, Chris, the, what was the, the other two, uh, Actually, I have that right here. 173, 726. 177,440. There were two others, including this one, which I didn't just read off. One did not comply at all with the um, with the specification. The other, although it was a lower amount, um, when we went through and investigated them during the first mm -hmm. round of bids, uh, we didn't feel that they they could produce a, an ambulance satisfactory to the town. Mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially, you're you're asking for the approval to purchase from Minuteman an amount um, something less than $176,000, is that yep. correct? I'm moving that we authorize, that we waive the bid process for the ambulance purchase and allow the chief to go ahead with the uh, Minuteman fire apparatus. Now, I would point out that I'm not sure. Yeah, that we're not waiving We did bid. I, I we think did all bid. we need to do oh, okay. is, right. is so simply approve the purchase. Authorize him to go ahead and purchase it. Purchase it at 176000 Do we have a second to that motion yet? I'll second it. Okay. Any um, no. further discussion? No. I, I would only comment that with a very narrow range like... Um, 173 to 177, we'd just be wasting people's yeah. time yeah. going yeah. out again. All in favor? Yeah. Unanimous. Okay. Continuing along. All right. The next item is um, I list it as fire station dispatch equipment, but uh, if, you, if you try to envision mm -hmm. a dispatch center, there's, for lack of a better way to describe it, the desk, the countertop that the dispatch radios, the dispatch computers, all of that stuff is mounted on all of the monitors. So when I started this project, that part of the cost was not built into the fire station cost. Yeah. It's one of the owner furnishing costs. Yeah. So uh, about five or six weeks ago, I think, um, I started investigating to find out what the layout could look like. Uh, kind of like you design a kitchen for a home. Mm -hmm. yep. You go to a uh, kitchen design place. They also sell the cabinets. They do the CAD drawings. They, they do all the layout for your kitchen. Then they put a cost to it. So I had, uh, I had started calling companies to see who was interested in doing the work for us. Uh, there were three. There is a fourth that does some custom work, but they just never submitted anything back to me. So I received three professional proposals based on the work that they had helped in the uh, the layouts. Truthfully, having no idea what the cost was going to be. Those costs came in at 24000 34000 39000 Far more than what I had hoped okay. to spend on this project. So I went back to each of the three that had submitted proposals and I told them there is absolutely no way I can afford to spend this much money for what I hope to accomplish. We made some modifications. They came back with um, new proposals. I've given you copies of those three proposals, and they are now at uh, um, around 18,000, yeah. 24,000, yeah. and 29,000. Um, the lowest proposal happens to be one in which, during my conversations with them, they told me flat out, by law, they cannot go below this number and that is because they have a GSA contract. Oh. If they were to go below the number that they gave me, then they would be in trouble with their GSA contract. Mm -hmm. So I can't see that even if I bid this, 
I would do any better than, than what we see now. Okay. How, how much time do you think you've got into this, Chris? <laughs> um, <laughs> probably five or six weeks at this point. Yeah. Five or six weeks and how many hours a week? Oh, oh no, uh, uh, that's just the overall amount of time. Yeah. Uh, I'd say maybe three hours a week. Okay. Yeah. I'd say probably like 15 hours total. Okay. Anybody have any questions or wish to make a motion? Or? I'll move that the chief go, uh, be allowed to go ahead and uh, spend what he needs to spend to get the dispatch. So you're looking well, for approval. What I'd like to do is exempt the sealed bid process and allow me to go with the, the three received proposals, okay. negotiate with the lowest of the three so proposals. We're it time. also happens to be uh, the only one that is local. The other two are across the country, yeah. which, I, which I found out. And when you look at their proposals, when you see the shipping cost, yeah. um, it varied between three and $4,000 just to ship so the, the stuff. So are, are you looking to, for, for authorization to make the purchase at an amount with a particular vendor? Looks like you say asking to yes. waive the bid process. Well, waive, waive the bid process right. so that I can make a purchase. Someone and then if, if it is With part of the purchasing policy, then I would make a recommendation that we purchase from right line, which is one of the mm -hmm. proposals that you have. And um, just <coughs> if it's acceptable to you. In an amount not to exceed $19,000? That would do. Yeah, it's 18375000 right now. And if there's a little bit extra wiggle room, I'm sure I can work on it. Okay, so the motion is you're looking to waive the formal bid process and make the purchase with right lines. W-R-I-G-H-T line, right. L-I-N. In an amount not to exceed $19,000. That's your motion. Add some of for the dispatch uh, set up. Somebody like to second that? I'll second it. Mike Pluff uh, is seconding that. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Now on to one of our Traffic signal, High Street exit. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of discussion on this, and I'll, I'll just start by telling you right up front, I don't have the experience to tell you the way it should be or shouldn't be. Um, I know a lot of people have looked at it. Mm -hmm. I've sat at all directions of that inter intersection mm -hmm. and observed the traffic flow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's just the way I view it. Mm -hmm. I see that it can work as it is. What we were asked to do last year was make a change that would prevent the vehicles from being trapped in the intersection. And that was the only direction we gave mm. to Sebago yeah. Technics. We said, listen, here's what we see. We see that they, they're allowed to enter the intersection preceding the green light. And then they get a red light when everybody else does and they're stuck there. Yeah. So he said, listen, the simple way to, uh, to correct that would be let's move the turn to the end of the green light signal mm -hmm. so that all they have is the green arrow and they can clear the intersection. Mm -hmm. It doesn't totally solve the problem. Yeah. Um, I had asked, how do we solve the problem? <laughs> and that's where we came up with a four or $5,000 proposal from them to come in and evaluate the intersection mm -hmm. And regardless, if, if we have three options, we can do nothing, leave it as it is. We could go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. Or we can, what I, what I would recommend is let's look at how to fix it the right way. And I think to fix it the right way, it's going to require that we spend some money. Mm -hmm. Someone has to look at the volume through the intersection, the number of turning movements, identify what the sequence should be, what the timing should be, how the the crosswalks factor in because one of the one of the other limiting features of the intersection is if you're in the northbound lane on Lafayette Road and you want to make that left turn mm -hmm. that left turn lane is is a very short distance yeah. unlike when you're coming from south mm -hmm. it can almost be an unlimited distance as you approach south so in the northbound lane if we restrict that left turning traffic we need to know what impact that has on the rest of the northbound traffic. And I don't know what that is, but I could envision that if there were a tractor trailer sitting there waiting to make that left turn and there was maybe one vehicle behind him, he could stop all northbound traffic. So we want to make sure that the timing is right, 
so that the sequence is right so that we don't just totally gridlock all northbound traffic. Fred, do you have any yeah. comments on this? <laughs> at this, we looked at this seven ways to Sunday, and, and uh, my initial thought was, and it still is to some degree, uh, and I'm not a traffic engineer, although I've worked with a couple over the past years, um, the turning traffic should go first. Yes. That clears the intersection. Now, the timing is difficult <coughs> because northbound traffic has a fairly short queuing line mm -hmm. to get into. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's right, if you have a tractor trailer going north and he's going to get in that queue line, he could hold up and tie up the entire northbound line True. for an extended period of time until everything else moves. Yeah. If you don't have your queuing movements for your turns to go first, you're going to get screwed in the intersection. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to get trapped. Something's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. But when you do that, you've also got to have a green and a red arrow on yeah. both sides, yeah. and you don't now. Without that, you really don't have the direction you need. So the chief outlined three choices, and his recommendation was we go and spend $4,000. Uh, uh, maybe we can do it for less. Uh, I did provide Sebago Technics with some information that we had on the turning counts that was done by uh, Hoyle Tanner as part of the Route 1 yeah. Lafayette Road intersection yeah. study. Mm -hmm. um, that may have an impact on what they're their fee is in terms of reducing their forty-five yeah. thousand dollar quote. It's yeah. What is your recommendation, Phil? I agree with the chief. Okay. We both well, talk about this. Well, we well, look at well, thoroughly. Well, wait a minute. There were two more people sitting there. All right, and you're all sitting down, so this won't horrify you too much. But Fred Rice and I actually agreed hmm. on put the signals back the way they were. You're not talking about northbound traffic, Fred. You're talking about westbound traffic. They're, they're, they're in the northbound lane, but they are turning onto Exeter Road. What the, the big problem that I had is when the green arrow disappeared with the southbound turning east onto High Street. And that stupid sign that says yield on green or whatever the hell it is, is two bars too far down. People can't relate to that when they're sitting at the intersection. Basically, all we need to do, and I'm not for spending any more money on any traffic engineers, put the lights back the way they were, let the turn lines go first, give a green arrow to turning both ways, sometimes because you may need a little bit longer green arrow, but whatever, because sometimes people will get clogged up in the lane turning westbound, heading pointed north but turning westbound, put the lights back, let the turn lanes go first, and then release the two north and southbound lanes. Question, That's all. Question That's before all. we get too deep into this. Is that the way they were before we mm -hmm. changed them the last time? It was. The, mm -hmm. the problem is that it, you... It's okay to permit the turning first. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the arrow goes off, mm -hmm. and it's just a green ball. And under green ball, left turning traffic is permitted to turn provided they yield to the oncoming traffic. Right. So they will continue to creep into the intersection. Yeah, I the do. The next yeah. color the signal will go is to red, yeah. yet they will be in the middle of the intersection on a red light. Well, if I'm in the middle of that intersection, Chief, if I'm not confused, from my experience going through it a million times, it seems, if I'm in the intersection, nobody is going anywhere until I get out of the middle because I'm blocking everybody. That was the problem. But, but you have, when, you're, when you are mm -hmm. on High Street heading west at the intersection, you have the yield on green because you've got people turning southbound off Exeter Road. It works very well. I've never been aware of a problem there at all. They obey that sign. All you need is the green arrow when you're northbound to turn west onto Exeter Road and then have the red arrow come on so that you're not impeding traffic. You may need a little bit longer time frame on both turns to allow the northbound turning west on Exeter Road to just to go through. But, but usually that's an not a very can long line. I, I, I would just like to remind people about yes. our agenda. And I just want to make one comment. Everybody's got an opinion about which way it should work. Yeah. I and I, I don't agree with you, and you don't agree with me, and vice versa all over the countryside. I think we ought to get the engi okay. engineers let, let, in. Let me ask a question, Fred or, or, or Chris. If, if, if we were to decide 
to go ahead with the evaluation. That that's four thousand, or maybe maybe it works its way down from there. Where would that be funded? Is that in the in the fire chief's budget, or is that somewhere else? Or? It's in the public works budget. The money's over in public works, okay. oh, God, love and, him. And, and the fire chief spends it. Okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. So do do are you comfortable? Your recommendation was to spend the four thousand or five thousand that we're hoping might be three thousand or four thousand or whatever. Are you comfortable that we have the funding to do that? No, I'm not From comfortable. We have the funding to do that. I'm not comfortable at all because that means that we have no further incidents with with any traffic lights in town for the entire year right well again that's one line yeah okay that that's right. that's one line we've got a five million dollar budget um, oh no we have money in the in the bottom line of the budget to do that that's yeah. okay and that, you have that, engineers that was my coming down yeah. from Maine that who was don't my question. okay can I get a chance to I've I've been quiet okay yes. first, first of all um, I I have I would not vote on on going one way or the other. I just am not knowledgeable enough. I'd just be wasting my time. So, you know, I, I just don't understand it enough. Um, my feeling is, is, is that the High Street, Exeter Road, Lafayette Road intersection is, is probably the busiest in town. We've got proposals out there to spend amounts of money like $600,000 on five corners and I don't remember the Mount Crazy. Keith on Landing Road, but it's a, a six-figure number or whatever. Um, so I, my feeling is, is if we've got the bottom line in the budget, and I suspect when you start you. talking about $4,000 in a $25 million budget, um, I, I think that that I, I think that, that is the, the best approach. So um, I don't know if you, how you basically were on the verge of a motion. Do you want to make that motion and see how the vote goes, or would you like me to I'll make a motion? I'll move that we just restore the signals to the way they were. Okay. And Do we have a second? And have the arrows... Okay. Do we camera. have a second Greener. for that motion? Well. Okay. I will make a motion that we um, proceed with with having Sebago um, evaluate the intersection uh, and and spend the four thousand dollars or forty five hundred dollars or, or thereabouts. With Do the I stipulation that they come in and talk to us before they make a final recommendation. Hmm. That's fine with me. Okay, do we have a Before second? Before anything gets changed, yeah. I, I would have to c bring the report back in uh, for discussion okay, with you. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Mr. Any Lyon. further discussion? All in favor? Four. Mary Louise? I'm opposed. Okay. Four one with Mary Louise opposed. Okay. Thank you. And the final item, Chief Fire Prevention Inspections. Yeah, I, um, I know this has been a subject of discussion yes. at, at various levels over the past few weeks. Um, yet I didn't really get an opportunity to come in and, and chat with you. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm here, let's put it on the uh, agenda. Yep. If you have questions, if you have suggestions, if you have ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I had spoken with Mr. Bean because he had some ideas about how we can use the technology to help streamline some of the mm -hmm. things we do. You know, there are some things that are accessible, there are things that we can do. I had actually spoken with the manager a few weeks ago. Um, one of the, one of the I, and I don't know how to make this work, but I was willing to take the lead to see if there is a way to do this. Um, some communities have a system in place where both their building inspection permits and their fire permits use the same system. And maybe that's something that we look for. I, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know how to make it happen. But if we look, there's probably, <coughs> a, there's probably a solution that can, that can help with that part of it. But that's only one, it's only one part of it. Uh, one of the other things that I left you with was uh, a copy of our current yeah. activities, and you can look through that. I mean, there's just pages and pages and pages of projects that are ongoing right now. Some of these permits have been issued, which means that follow-ups are required. Yeah. Some of these are still in the review phase. Some of these are completed. Some of these are um, complaints. Uh, you know, that we have to follow up on. I don't think I included any investigations. And at the very end, you'll see a copy of our call log mm -hmm. so that we do record all incoming phone calls mm -hmm. so we know who called and when they called. We don't indicate what the nature of the call is because that goes on, you know, a separate handwritten um, note. But regardless, I think we're at a point where we've got such a high volume of, yes. of activity going on. And although, you know, we do see seasonal changes in the community, I think really the nature of what we're discussing are the bigger projects, are the newer projects. 
the people that open on a recurring basis, I don't think that most of them suffer at all. I think that uh, you know the majority of those for our recurring inspections are the assembly inspections. Those are the seasonal ones. Mm -hmm. It's the new business. It's the the new project, the new building, mm -hmm. you know, the new sprinkler system, the major modification. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that tend to be slower through the mm -hmm. process, and that's where I think that uh, that we need the help to make sure that these projects are getting processed in a more timely manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, just one quick one, and I won't belabor it because I know everybody's in a rush to move along. I have no problem with that. So you believe, generally speaking, that this year wasn't a seasonal thing where everybody wants things done yesterday because they want to open their shop up like they did last year on the 1st of June? Um, what we find is that the season for businesses uh -huh. tends to be seasonal, yeah. but the holdup is generally with those who are newer businesses, not the recurring opening business. So, for, for example, yeah. uh, there were maybe one or two businesses that wanted to open around the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they couldn't, not because we were holding them up, but because to open, the, the building owner had to have final sign-offs on things like the sprinkler system mm -hmm. and the fire alarm system. Yeah. They weren't in the control of the business that wanted to open, oh. yet they weren't ready to be signed off. Yeah. So, you know, as a building owner, once I sell a unit, it now becomes the property of that new business owner, and they're kind of at the mercy of the, the process of timing. <laughs> so, unfortunately, yeah. well, I guess they not, not so much the nature of them, I guess maybe my question should say, but the volume, the actual numbers of mm -hmm. requests we have, say, in May versus June versus December, okay. it must go really up in the spring, right? Only because that's when most uh, developers want to start construction projects. Exactly. So and it's also when some of the businesses come in and want to make their modifications. Exactly. The, b the best advice I could give to any business is if you know your busy season is from June through September, make your modifications, do your work from September to May. Exactly. I agree with that. So would you be looking to increase the number of staff year-round or just during that busy season? Absolutely year-round. It's not, mm -hmm. there isn't a busy season. Okay. It, these projects are occurring all year long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chief. And, and it's the, it's the uh, complexity as well. For example, the brewery. That's a project that we could put one person on, mm. you know, to manage. And just that would be their one project because it's complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mary Louise, you had something? Yes. I absolutely support getting funding in the chief's budget to restore the position of fire mm -hmm. inspector in the Hampton Fire Department. And we are, dis we are talking about a fully-fledged, fully-qualified firefighter, aren't we? Uh, they kind of have to be in our department. Thank you. Unlike the building department, mm -hmm. I'll call them civilians. Right. Um, when they're members of the fire department, they mm -hmm. still have to wear protective clothing. They have to wear uh, breathing apparatus. They have to have the skills mm -hmm. to enter burning buildings. We're talking about a professional position here, correct? Well, I think all positions of the town. No, are but I'm they're talking about for the from point of view of being qualified as a well, I would firefighter. Agree. Yes. Okay. Anything else? No, well, that's it. Thanks very much, Chief. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Come back and visit any time. Keith Noyes, DPW Director. It's like an even longer list. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Excuse me for a second, gentlemen. I'll be a minute for item. I will again reiterate that we're way behind on our agenda. Well, that's what meetings are for, and we're going to stay here till we finish. Well, I think we're going to stay here till 11. Well, we maybe. didn't make the agenda up, did we? No. Um, oh my God. First item on the list, Hampton dewatering upgrade change order decrease in the amount of $859. Do you want to speak to that, Keith? Sure. Good evening. Um, the good news is that this project, <laughs> the dewatering project that was um, actually, I think it went for a warrant article in 2010, I believe, um, has come in within the budget. 
Um, the original Warren article, as it was crafted, included um, a lot more work than um, what we had, uh, what was actually funded. The estimate was, was much lower, but we were able to get the um, essence of the project completed to the satisfaction of New Hampshire DES in the administrative order that we had. Mm. Um, so the total contract price at this point is just over a million dollars. Um, in an effort to look at um, areas that we could um, save in the budget, we did some um, uh, value engineering uh, with some of the components where we didn't uh, compromise the quality of the product or the, the project by n no means, but just by looking at different uh, options, we were able to save approximately $22,000. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we did some uh, modifications to the polymer system and the skater system, uh, and that came to approximately $14,000. Uh, we also deleted a hoist, which we found was unnecessary in the long run for our needs were, and that was um, a deduct of $1,000. So one of the things that we would like to do that um, we had intended initially to do, and it's, 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 it's part of the, you know, something that needs to be done or should be done, is painting of the uh, floor, because on mm -hmm. the concrete floor we had to excavate a portion of the floor to put in the new drain. So we are looking at an add-on on that of about $7,000. So when you work out the math, uh, it actually works to a decrease in the, uh, uh, in the budget of $859,000. $859. It was almost music to my ears. $859.06. Um, so I'm just asking the approval of the board to authorize the town manager to sign this change order. Um, and that'll complete the project. Okay. I, I, I looked also it all over. It all um, made, sense. made sense to me. Yep. Um, my only question, quite frankly, is we've approved this project. Um, these changes, which look very normal, ends mm -hmm. up in a small yeah. reduction. My only question is why does it need to come before the Board of Selectmen? Two reasons. Uh, the town has a history of doing change orders and not letting the Board know yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, and in, in most cases in the past, the town has gotten in trouble for it for one reason or another. Uh, the second is I, I really don't like change orders on million dollar contracts without the Board knowing yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. and my motive was to have Keith come in and just tell you what was going on. Okay, it's that's perfectly fine. acceptable. Yeah. We don't need a motion then. No, you don't need a motion. Okay. Oh, right. okay. Um, next item, winter maintenance plan. Keith. Thank you. Um, this is a project that's been in the works for probably too long. Uh, it's been one of those projects that we've been picking away at over time. Um, hasn't been on the highest of the priority list, but it has been something that we have been continually working on. And this is a development of the winter maintenance of roads, sidewalks, and parking area uh, standard operating procedures, which is useful for our department for a guide to go by, but also to help explain to the public uh, why we do what we do and, 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 and how we do it. And I find it's a, a useful tool, uh, especially when the uh, Board of Selectmen um, review it and are supportive of uh, the, the variety of, of different issues that are in here, whether it's the replacement of mailboxes or just how we go about ch selecting uh, sidewalks on priorities as far as which sidewalks get um, completed first in our whole de-icing operations. So um, I've given the board a copy of this. I know Mark Gerald's had some last minute revisions that uh, he had, as I understand, it provided you a copy of. Uh, but I'm really here just to respond to any questions or concerns. And once you're all set with it, is to have the board um, adopt it as a policy. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yep. Page nine. So this is not Keith so much as a clarification from this board. I think I've asked about this with our discussion of private roads. It says any private road that is not designated emergency lane under town ordinance is not maintained by the town. Um, so basically you mean you're not yeah. going to be plowing it if it's not designated an emergency lane. 
we've got to watch out what we're doing with this emergency lane stuff. And, and I want to get into a further discussion of that when we're talking about private roads. But the, um, your proposition to put this in debate, very good, very, very well done, very explicit. But that private road thing, uh, I think we've still got to work on. Okay. Do we have a motion to adopt it? Um, I'm not ready to do that yet till we clarify that private road part. Go ahead. What? what? I said I'm not ready to move to adopt it yet. Yeah, it's, very, it's very well done, but I want a clarification on that private road thing. Because well, we're sitting here trying to figure out what's a, what's a private... No! What is a private? I've got a list in here of private roads. Yes, no, whatever. I don't know. I still don't know what we're doing on private okay. roads. Can, can I confirm that the only private roads that we are plowing are ones that the town has adopted as an emergency lane? That's my understanding. That's my Do we understanding. have a list of them? Do I? I don't I know which ones are. I'm sure we do. Posted I as a road. Well, right. I mean, I've got this list right here, private roads. Uh, yes, Acorn Street, <laughs> no, Anchor Court, whatever. I mean, what... You're, you're Mary Louise, you're confused. But he's you're got to understand... Mary Louise, you're yes. confusing trash pickup with snow plowing. No, I'm not, because private roads are not supposed to have either supposed to any public services. Private roads that and we've... Private roads that we, as Board of Selectmen, <coughs> have voted to adopt as emergency lanes. Like Keith Avenue. Yes. There's roughly about 30 of them. Uh -huh. Okay. Are plowed. Those have been adopted as emergency lanes. And I suspect I don't have the list handy. Right. But we have th there are all formal motions going back two to three years of selectmen meetings. Okay. okay. I don't think that there's, there's certainly no reason why some combination of Fred and Keith can't get the list to you of those uh, roads okay. that have been adopted by votes of selectmen's meeting right. as emergency lane. But I don't believe that that prevents us from adopting the winter maintenance plan. But I'm saying that once one more time. What, what differentiates the private roads where we are going to have the emergency lane designation with all the rest of the other private roads? The votes that have been taken by the Board of Selectmen to designate them as emergency lane. That's wonderful. But you're, you're doing... You know, that, has, that has already been done. That is in place. If you want to reverse that at, at some point in the future, certainly feel free to make a motion. But that does not prevent us from adopting the winter maintenance plan. Okay, but I'm I'm concerned about that particular. Okay. Aspect. I would make a motion that uh, we adopt uh, this the, the winter Chairman, maintenance plan. This Mr. Chairman, I, I see your point. I'm not trying to be, prolong the agony here, but it says the town does not main sidewalks on state or private property. Right. It's, and it goes on to say uh, emergency lane on this point b above it. I think we have to make sure that that's very clear. Is that perfectly clear to everybody that that's what that says? A private road is not designated, not main, is not main, maintained by the town. Does that cover everything that's out there as far as you got the private roads and so forth? I'm, I'm not trying to mix I'm it up. I'm not sure what your question is. Why don't you try it? Well, we have roads that we have accepted as town property or town roads. And we have roads that we have not. And so we have a private road on page 9, nine of 14. Correct. Any private road is not designated emergency lane under the town ordinance right. uh, 805.14 is not maintained by the town. Yes. Right. Does that cover everything? No, only, the, only some of the private roads. What, what that basically says is that we do, implicit in that is we do, plow roads that have been designated as an emergency lane. Okay, right. I, got, I got that part. So that covers everything. And, and that is something okay. that has we have gone through. And there are a number of, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but there are a number of private roads that we do not maintain. Right. Wow. They're not we emergency not lane. Because then they haven't been designated right. a uh, emergency lane. The, these are all, I just wanted to make sure all that of these designations have taken place at selectmen's yeah. meetings. They've been voted on. This goes back to 2009. I would say that it went on in probably at least three separate but three three, three, three sets meetings. of meetings, yeah. So at any but, rate, I would... But we're discriminating. We're doing what you said you didn't want to do when we started discussing this earlier. Either all the private okay, roads for Mary purposes Louise, of if plowing... You wanna, if you want to change those, you can, okay? But that's a different issue than adopting the winter maintenance plan, okay? Well, I, I agree with that. We, we have, as a board, okay, 
we have chosen and taken votes <coughs> to designate roughly 30-ish roads Picking as emergency them out lanes. one by one. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the basic, yeah. just so you know, okay, yeah. and I would assume you would have been watching back yeah. three or four years ago when this yeah. took place, yeah. the basis was such that we continue could continue to plow those that we were already plowing. So, for example, I suspect roads like Cole Street, mm -hmm. Taylor River Estates, no? No. Ru no. Um, ones that were being done were ultimately designated as emergency lanes and have been plowed since then. Mm -hmm. Roads like mine, Great Boars Head Avenue, mm -hmm. which was not plowed, continues not to be plowed by right. the town or whatever. <laughs> so if for some reason you wished to change those roads that are designated as emergency lanes in the future, okay. you could do that, but that is independent of uh, approving so the winter maintenance. So you had a cutoff maintenance. in time there where right. exactly. you were keeping we, services we in the Exactly. We purely did the ones that were already being done. So I would make a motion okay. to adopt the winter maintenance plan. I second. All in favor? Unanimous. We're up to nine. <laughs> we give a time update. And we're going to blame it on you, Mr. Chairman. Time index. Yes. The really Next valid. item, Keith, sidewalk maintenance plan. And this is another um, project that has been in the works for so some time, although we did want to finish the pavement plan <laughs> for the entire town, the, the road pavement plan, before we worked on this. And uh, this is literally just what we did with the um, pavement program. Uh, major streets and the road pavement program where we've gone out and inspected the roadways and the sidewalks and we've come up with a rating system and we've prioritized the sidewalks based on their use, their proximity to the schools as well as their condition and we've come up with a prioritized list of, um, of maintenance of the sidewalks. This plan does incorporate our present level of spending which is $26,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since I've been here, because each year the budget is right. is in the red, or close to being in the red, I should say, uh, we haven't been able to do any sidewalk maintenance for the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the other factor that I want to bring to the attention of the board is the decision of this town or whoever to put in all concrete sidewalks. Uh, concrete sidewalks are great for down south uh, where you don't have mm. um, salt. salt, salt, but the worst enemy of a sidewalk is, is salt and, and um, it really chews it up. So what we've planned on doing is um, is trying to make as a priority, priority the ceiling of the uh, present concrete sidewalks to try to extend their lifespan and that's what our top priority is now is to go in and rather than building any new sidewalks is to do as much sealing of the sidewalks with a high quality sealer as, as we can. So that's what's kind of prioritized at this point. Um, so that pretty much looks like it ties it up through 2018 <laughs> then based on that funding. Well, based on the 26,000. And then there it appears to me there's another 5.2 million um, yeah. On the list. Well, it's a um, scary list. On that. Any questions or comments? Oh, I only have one comment. When I saw that, I said this proves that we should have been spending that twenty some thousand every year for the last umpteen years. Mm -hmm. And I can remember complaining about that when I was on the budget mm -hmm. committee. Uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Ladies Woolsey, you are aware of that. I used to like to complain about a lot of things, and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't. I really don't see why we can't go ahead and do this unless we're totally out of money in your department. Okay. Anything else on the sidewalk management? Sure. Okay. Bid award. We'll start with uh, the I&I uh, &I study in Underwood mm -hmm. Engineers, um, Keith. If, if I may, because I want to um, personally apologize to Mr. Noyes for having a serious brain cramp the last time we sat here and talked about this. Uh, because from the uh, minutes of April 29th, 2013, um, Mr. Noyes read his memo on why he's recommending the waivers on the purchasing policy and procedures for both the INI study and Exeter Road by using a five-stage process of the RFQ. Selectman Woolsey motion to waive the purchasing policy and procedures for the infiltration and inflow study project, the Exeter Road survey and preliminary design project. Mr. Moore seconded. And that was a four to one vote in favor. So we had already voted to waive 
the procedure for Keith. I, that's why I emailed it to everybody mm. the next day. Yes. That yes. whatever reason that struck me, but it, it yeah. just so, so you're aware it is a little bit more complicated than that. First of all, the the waivers that Keith requested and we granted or whatever, which were essentially um, to not go through the formal bid process, right. and he came up with a little bit different approach, which I thought was a smart approach. Where he's qualifying yep. his, his his firms first. I thought that was great. Okay, mm -hmm. that was absolutely fine, but that doesn't carry through the entire bid process. Okay. However, when this was presented to us last week, it was presented to us for approval because it is over fifty thousand right. dollars okay all awards over fifty thousand dollars have to come to the board of selectmen in a public meeting and it did okay so as as far as i'm concerned throughout the whole process on this one um this both of these um were clean um so this is they, authorization they, to they were both absolutely fine and let me just point 50, out let me just point out one yeah. other nuance as well. Yeah. When when Phil had made the motion about the emails coming to us for those over 15,000 or whatever, yeah. I would simply suggest that that is something that is not necessary in an item over $50,000 because the approval is going to be sought from us in a public meeting yeah. by definition of the yeah. purchasing policy. Okay. So if we wanted to um, change, it, it might be appropriate if if you want to get technical in terms of the the wording there, mm. that the email applies to those in the fifteen to fifty thousand dollar range, ah. whereas fifty thousand, I mean, if, if you're coming come before in. us, okay. that's better than an email. Yeah. You, okay. you know, you, and and let me make one other comment as well. I think it's absolutely fine, as far as I'm concerned. It's Fred and department heads call in a situation like this. The department head doesn't necessarily need to be here. Okay, if, yeah. if Fred is here and yeah. he's got the information yeah. and he says to the department head, you don't have to be out at 8 o'clock or whatever that night, yeah. I'll handle it. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, so okay. at any rate, I would make a motion. Let's take them one at a time. I would make a motion to approve the infiltration and inflow study um, awarded to Underwood Engineers um, in the amount of 51300 Do I have a second? Yep, for that? I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Okay, the next one. Um, survey preliminary design for reconstruction of the Exeter Road. Everything I said um, about the first one <laughs> applies to this one, although I do have a couple of questions on it unrelated to the process. Okay, there, there, there's, but there's no, in terms of compliance with the policy, Keith, there's absolutely no right. issue at all. This, you know, you. was. Um, does anybody, I've got a few questions. Anybody else have any questions on, on this? So we're accepting the. Well, I, I have a couple well. of somewhat technical questions oh, okay. or whatever, and, and I, I think there's really um, only one. When when we first, if, if you go back, and, and my numbers may be off a little, Keith, you tell me if they are, but we came in with, with some amounts to do Exeter Road, which basically ended up at about $2.9 million, as I recall, and, and those were essentially broken out into several areas. One was, was um, engineering, which I think was something like $300,000 or so. Uh, and let me back up a second. This was for the section of Exeter Road that is not done, was, which is essentially from Timber Swamp Road out to the bridge um, at, at, at Lafayette Road or whatever. One piece of it driving that $2.9 million number was the engineering at approximately that amount. Yep. I think that was something like $500,000 in paving costs. The majority of, of the expense had to do with the underground infrastructure, um, sewer and, and, and drainage and, and whatever. We looked at that and there was a lot of discussion, as you may recall, wow, I mean, if you run that out over our 77 miles of roads, even though everything is going to cost the same, we need to look more closely at, at this, and, and that's what the intention of this is. The one thing that, in, in looking through the bid spec and all, that I thought I was going to see in this one and didn't, and it may not be a problem, but I want to bring it up, is, is I had hoped or had the impression that, that we were going to be looking at, at trenchless technologies um, as possibilities in conjunction with this bid. Things like, um, and, and I, I'm saying names that I, I really don't know what they mean, maybe Mike does whatever, but, but things like tunneling, pipe bursting, alternatives to, to trench digging. Um, they will be. Okay, that, that's, be. and the only other comment I would make is um, I observed 
walking the dog in the aquarium work um, on Church Street, if you remember, um, about two months ago or so, whatever. That's exactly what they did. And it looked right. to me like they had the vendor that you used to do some um, camera work up on Winnicott Road doing mm -hmm. that. So, okay. So that I, I didn't see any objectives, but that is part of it then. Yes. Okay. That being the case, then I would make um, a motion to approve the um, preliminary design for reconstruction of Exeter Road with CMA engineers for $51,000, and I've included the amount that they included in there, the 16000 in their uh, subcontract, I assume it is, for the survey and video inspection. Mm -hmm. Do I have a second for that? Sure. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank great. you. Okay. Next item. Direction on secession of trash and recycling collection private property, a decision that we've already made. We made that, was that last week? It seems like about 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it was certainly more than 100 hours ago. But um, at any rate, basically what we have, I, I assume that the objective of this um, agenda item is, is simply right. the approval of the letter. Um, does anybody have any comments on the letter? I have a couple. Um, one is is that... Certainly, it's, it's, it's the Board of Selectmen that made this decision, and I think in the first sentence it says, please be advised that per the decision of this Board, I think it ought to say per the decision of the Board of Selectmen, but I think that the memo ought to come from somebody who's responsible for implementing that decision, whether it's the town manager or the DPW director. Right. Certainly, no problem at all with saying that we made the decision if somebody, you know, doesn't like it and whatever, but that would be one suggestion. So who would you like on there? Doesn't matter. Just I'll sign. I have a problem. Okay. okay. It's the direction of the board. We just do yep. that. It's normal routine. Um, second of all, the question in the last paragraph. Please note that the materials that are to be placed in the town's issued rubbish and recycling carts only. The carts are available for purchase at the transfer station. If you have any questions, um, mm -hmm. please call the rubbish and recycling hotline. Is is some of these people probably aren't going to be happy, although I don't think there's too many of them based on, mm -hmm. you know, we mm -hmm. had visibility yeah. to list. Yeah, my only question is, do you want to put this on the transfer station coordinator or do you want to um, put it at a little bit higher level or, or or just simply leave it at this and then if somebody's upset... I don't even mind putting my name down there, okay. to be honest with you. I, I just, you know, some there's a possibility yeah. of somebody no, not I, being I, happy. I it's that. our decision. I'm good with uh, it. I'm okay with that. Okay. Well, I think you ought to leave it the way it is. Then if, if your person who's answering the hotline gets a lot of runaround, they can just <laughs> hand it over to you. Kick that's it up, no too. course, anyway. That goes that, that's fine. <laughs> e either way is fine. Richard, right. right on that section where you are, because I have a suggestion. Okay. Actually, I think we need to do it. You need to put in the price per cart. Of carts available are 35 gallon, 64 gallon, 96 gallon, whatever. At priced at whatever. I, I don't think you want to. Well, yeah, you're asking. I don't them think we you're need. Them I don't have think the we cards. need to approve that. What is he going to do? Come back to us if the price changes. The prices yeah. do well, change. The prices go up a couple of dollars next year. The prices I don't think change. I don't think that's a little well, detailed. Don't, don't you think they need to know that? Yeah, but I don't think it needs to be in this memo that we're approving tonight because the prices change. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that whether this is the place for it or not, I'll let you decide. But we did also um, make a policy decision on the reimbursement for the return of carts. For, for example, if somebody on 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 like decides that they're because we're not going on private property to no longer use the town and they have no use for the carts, my recollection is, is we decided that they would be fully reimbursed mm -hmm. um, for what they originally paid for the carts that they returned. And that's, I think that goes under the general direction of if you have any questions, please call the rubbish and recycling hotline because right. really there there'll be certain a number of those type of questions that my staff will be more than okay. you know they'd but, be able to respond. But are we to all those. clear that that was a decision yes. that we yes. made? That was a okay, decision. okay, that's fine. I would make a motion um, to approve the letter reflecting the the. the Comments that we made and amendments, or whatever. I'll Do I have a second? Yeah. Second from Mike Pierce. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Next item: policy on solid waste pickup on private roads. Mary Louise, why don't you start this? You yes. brought it up. Uh, and we have a, a still in a rather indeterminate list. How? It never occurred to me that if you purchase property on a private road, that it's not incorporated into your deed. I find that pretty horrible. 
And then the terms of what you own of the private road, you know, do you own to the center line, whatever. So that certainly makes it difficult. I was under the impression that if you are living on a private road, and Bob Ladd made some good comments last week, if you're living on a private road, that you understood you're living on a private road and that you had signed on to live on a private road when you bought your property. So uh, I don't know whether, um, hmm, mm -hmm. well, it probably wouldn't have anything really to do with Ed Tinker until after you've purchased it. So I, I, there are loopholes in there. Um, I, uh, I have, um, let's see, are we, are we talking about doing the same thing with the exception of that trailer park uh, on the private roads that we have picked up? I don't, I'm not comfortable hey, can with I, can that. Can I put some facts yeah, because out there? I okay. First of all, I went through the list, and, and I think it's accurate to say that we're not sure if this is complete. Right. But, but I think it's fairly it's in, pretty encompassing. Close. There are 54 private roads okay. on this list. Okay. There are 10 um, approved roads, Alexander Drive, Ash Street, Downer, et cetera, which I'm viewing, th those are not private roads, those are strictly administrative glitches. Okay. Yes. And, and, yep. and those will be taken care of through warrant articles, whatever. Right. So the, the approved roads aren't really part of it. The Class 6 roads, quite frankly, um, there's only three homes on one road. Um, this this Bashby yeah. um, is listed. There's no, there's no pickup taking place on the other two. Yeah. Um, the one's not a street, and, and we're apparently picking up. At Bashby only has three ho houses on it. That's right. why I'm saying mm -hmm. there's only three. Okay. Um, just what it's worth, um, several weeks ago in the course of the discussion, and this is just, I'm just putting facts out there. Um, the the west side trailer park roads um, appear to have dropped off the, the radar with this list. And I'll, I'll just point Hemlock out to you, for example, Haven Road, Hemlock Road, Town yeah. Road, are three in one of the developments or, or, or whatever. I'm just pointing that out as, as, yeah. as, as a fact. Um, bottom line is, is on the private roads, 54 private roads, the town is picking up trash and recycling on 26 of the 54 based on the ones with the notation wow. um, yeah. right. that, that Keith had, had, had put there. Um, I looked at, at, at three deeds um, for homes on, 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 on private roads, one of which um, happens to be um, my own and and don't go looking for any consistency anywhere well, in that type of thing because I mean my deed pro the language of my deed probably originated a hundred years ago yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. some of these are more recent more. or whatever yeah. how they how they address um, even the road for example on mine it refers to, to my road as a driveway and yeah. then I have an easement right. that allows me to pass back and forth to Ocean Boulevard okay whereas wow. You know, th there are several others that are different. Yeah. One thing I will say from those that I've looked at, and I've looked at a number of other deeds um, in the past, not for this purpose, is I've never seen anything a de in a deed, and I don't think it's g got a place in a, in a deed, that delineated what town services somebody would or would get. Right. So right. you'd have no, I, I believe, you know, you'd really have no idea. I knew because when I bought the house, they had already stopped snow plowing. They had already right. stopped picking yeah. up trash. And, and, and I heard rumor there was a street light at one time, but I never <laughs> saw it or whatever. So at any rate, speaking to the assessor, one additional fact. There is no automatic adjustment in the valuation of a property simply because you're on a private road. Mm -hmm. there, there is absolutely not one. There are some examples of private roads where there are adjustments, but not because it's a private road. Mm -hmm. In some cases, for example, mine, it's, it's not only a crushed stone road, it's only one lane right, wide. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, literally, if and this happens, like if somebody's driveway. coming up, yeah. I, gotta, oh, I guess i got to back up to let them buy or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, given that background, I, I personally am not in favor of, of making any changes to those private roads um, that, that we are currently picking up. Um, it's not an issue that, that I think we're going to be addressing tonight, but I'll just make the comment I'm, I'm not um, you know, particularly in favor of taking on any private roads that we're not mm -hmm. already doing. And okay. I think it's the same spirit as, as the snow plowing okay. where we establish the emergency lane, something we don't have to do with the, with the trash. Um, so I would just um, leave this 
leave this one the way it is. The DPW yes. director knows what, which ones he's okay. doing, which ones he's not, and um, I, I would suggest that, that we continue doing what we're doing. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to make a, a one point, though. If we take a road and make an emergency lane on a private road, that means we can plow it, right? And if we don't make an emergency lane, how do we expect the garbage trucks to go down a road that has six feet of snow? So that has to be some kind of consistency. There has to be some kind of consistency. One has to go with the other. In my I point. don't think we're going to solve that tonight. I think that that's mm. something that falls under the purview of the DPW director. And I think if that was a problem, um, I think we would have heard of it by now. I, I don't see how I, I understand your point, Mike, but I don't understand how we solve anything here on on a on a hypothetical yeah. what might be going on. Well, you? all I can say to that is that if my guys told me that they couldn't get down a road because it hadn't been plowed, it's a private road. I'd just say then you wouldn't go down the road. You don't go down the road. And, and and if if there's a situation where let's say the private entity is taking care of that plowing, then I guess they don't get their trash picked right. up that way. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you deal with it now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, can we move off for that one then? That opened a large can of worms, much larger yeah. than I thought when we first started talking about the private yeah. roads and private property. It can be interesting. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Keith, um, next two items, <laughs> just for the background information, just to be sure you, you got it, is okay. similar to our discussion with the fire chief on the pumper. Um, there, there was a discussion of two warrant articles which fall under your um, area responsibility, one being the sewer and drain building, which is currently um, on the CIP and discussed as a 2014 warrant article at $500,000. Again, the sewer and drain building and the wash bay, kind of two separate but combined entities. And then the other discussion being the five corners intersection reconstruction improvement and whether or not to go forward with that, wh whether to leave it where it is, which I think is in 2015. Do I have that correct? I think that's yeah. correct. Yeah, I think it's correct. Oh. By the way, while we're on the five corners, are we at the five corners yet, or are you no, just talking about Let's do the other one first, and it is. I'll confirm <laughs> that it is so. in 2015. Yeah. I just looked at the CIP. Yeah. Yeah. So th there was kind of a, a mixture of opinions as to whether or not to go forward with that, and we just basically said, let's table it until the following week when the DPW director is in. Um, the only thing that, that, that I would comment to get the, the discussion going is just factual information. Um, to do with the financials. In 2014, um, we've, we've got an 8% increase in the municipal budget, which has now become, it won't be 11% if we proceed with the five-year financing, mm -hmm. but it'll be certainly be more than 8%. I suspect use 9% mm -hmm. as an example yeah. if it's spread over five years. But with this wash buy-in there, we're at 8%, now 9%, 5% without the um, $500,000 in there. And personally, I, I think that that's got a problem with the voters. And, and the reason I say that is, number one, the voters turned it down last time at $500,000. I think my own personal opinion is is a bigger reason for turning it down, more so than, than the fact that it was a garage and a wash bay for 500000 was the total amount of the stuff that was on there was a 6.6% increase. And now we're going in, you know, with a heavier one at this point where we're looking like we're asking for 9% or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I just threw out the idea, does it make sense to strictly go forward with the wash bay, 100, 150,000, whatever that is, do it in such a manner that it doesn't prevent adding the sewer and drain garage at a, at a, at a separate date? And that's when we said, we don't want to go any further. Let's <laughs> throw that out there when the DPW <coughs> director. So that, right. that's kind of sure. where we're at on that. And maybe you want to comment, or maybe other board members want to comment. Well, thank you for the opportunity to do so. I appreciate that. Uh, clearly, I mean, I am very, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see the project be done in, in its entirety. I said right along since I've been here for the last uh, two years that I feel it's necessary. I feel for a variety of reasons that I've explained time and time again to everybody. Yeah. Um, but I also understand the political reality of, of the budget in this town and what, what the people are up against. And I to use the term 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing. But in the case of if, if the board is going, if, if my preference would be I'd have five members of the board of selectmen supporting 
a warrant article for $500,000 to do it right initially. That's clearly what, what I'm at. I, I think that if I was to pursue it without um, the, well, of course, if it wasn't even the majority, I don't think I'd have a chance in the world. But it, even my, my thought is at this point is that if I only have three of the board members supporting it and two opposing it, I think I'm going to lose everything. And I think that um, that's where I'm at. Uh, we did price out just doing the wash bay itself. And it's more, I thought we could do it for 150, but to do it in its entirety, to be closer, to be make sure we've got all the bases covered, would be about $200,000. So um, uh, th that's a number that you'd have to think about. But uh, I don't know what else to say about it, you know, other than what I just said. Okay. How do you wash the vehicles now? What does the EPA allow you or not allow you to do on public works property? We can wash the vehicles in an area that has a gravel base that's not frozen and has no runoff into any uh, stream or into the marsh or, you know, that type of thing. So that's what we would do right now in the summertime. We would take it. We've got a few places that we can take it. It's kind of jury rigged. We've just got regular garden hoses. Or we can do it inside where the, uh, the wash water is contained and then gets treated at the wastewater treatment plant. That's not, with the confines of our buildings and splashing and everything with dirt, that doesn't make s too much sense, especially for the bigger trucks. I mean, it right. just logistically doesn't work. Right. Uh, and I can tell you that it's, it's not, if we had a more efficient operation, it would be done a lot more not just on public works vehicles, but all the town vehicles mm -hmm. would be able to use this facility, which would have, you know, the undercarriage wash and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So we, so we have our investment in rolling stock deteriorating basically before its time because you can't maintain them on a frequent basis. You can't. That goes without question. I mean, you talk to anybody in the know, and they will tell you that corrosion prevention yeah. is going to save, or it's not save, but certainly appreciably extend the lifespan of our all our vehicles and equipment. And without that building, the uh, sewer jet truck is going to stay outdoors and the water in it will freeze? Well, you can't leave the water in it. You can't leave water in it. Oh, okay. You have to put it in where it's so you I was presuming that that goes into one of the existing on the garages yeah. in the weather it's cold yeah. and yeah. it's got water in it. Okay. Well, does, does somebody want to make a motion or whatever as to how we handle this? I mean, we've basically like to got, we've got like three choices here. I'd uh, like to make a motion that we dump that one. You don't, you know, you have... Is that clear You enough? have two ways to go here. You're looking, you just got done looking at okay, the Okay, do we have a, do we have a second okay. for Mike's motion? To get rid of the, for this, this I, cycle. I know what your motion is. We, okay. we keep... Kicking we we appear we appear to have failed um, for yeah. lack of a second on that. I, I'm trying to keep it moving, Mary Louise. I know, but you okay. Okay. Um, does anybody want to make a different motion that uh, we go forward with it, or the two choices we have left are that we go forward with it, or we go forward with the wash bay only? I'll move that we go forward. I'll move that we go forward with the project. I'm going to tell you why. I don't want to see some half-witted thing like that stupid-looking salt shed take place. Well, it's true. And we've stalled long enough on this stuff. The chickens that keep, keep coming home to roost. I'll move that we go ahead with that, review the, the presentation, and check up on what modern I stuff I second the cost. motion. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion. I would simply... Um, comment that that um, I, I, I just don't see um, going out and, and asking the voters for a 9% increase in the municipal tax rate. It's not that I've got a problem with the garage or the um, wash down facility or whatever. I would support um, the, the wash bay only. I assume, Mike, I assume you know more about this stuff than any of us, but I assume you are oh. You're supportive of the benefits of having a wash bay and all that? I am if it's used. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I think the other part of that is I think 
the garage is oversized. And when I say that, I mean that most of the equipment could be parked in an open shed. But I do understand that you need the building for the washdown facility. Probably needs one or two bays for the for the jet truck and some other stuff that sh should be inside so that they could use it year-round if the necessity came about, mm -hmm. rather than having it parked outdoors. Uh, I think that there's a compromise here between we've jumped the wash down facility from a hundred and something to two hundred thousand and I think the garage could be done at something less than three hundred thousand okay um, I think there's some room to work on this oh, plan good. and if you got it to the right amount and I think Rather than just build a washdown facility and then try to add the garages mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. I think you need to do the first portion of that together. Yeah, and then the extra base. Uh, could, you, could you're saying you you would support it, but basically only on a smaller scale. Smaller yeah. scale, yeah. Okay. For the I, I would add my comment that I would add to what Mike said. Um, I think that's good input, and I respect his input because of what he does. Yep. You know, um, if we're talking about computers, maybe it would be me or Mike or whatever. But at any rate, I also just have to point out that in 2012, basically everybody, meaning both selectmen, budget committee, taxpayer group, everybody was supportive of everything, and everything passed. Every single item passed. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you look back, to 2013 with a 6.6 percent increase or whatever mm -hmm. those items that were supported by all of the select and whatever passed yeah. those where there were disagreements mm -hmm. did not pass mm -hmm. so my suggestion based on the comments that have been made is is that we not go forward with a sewer and drain building and equipment wash bay but I think we've opened the door up to Keith and there's time okay for this coming Warren article for an alternative plan that's less expensive than the current plan, and you well, can well, go may back I, and. May I, is a point of order? Sure. There's a motion on the floor, and I haven't heard a vote yet. Do you want to? I don't mind on. adapting my motion to ask the uh, to have this on the warrant as a warrant article predicated on a redesign at a little bit lower. Okay, so we're cost. not going forward with the five hundred thousand right. dollar proposal. So you're in your motion, and it's a moot point right now. And, and I think it would be um, a mistake to try and put another number on it or whatever. Right. I, I think we just Ask basically we, we kind of left the door open for an alternative proposal, mm -hmm. I think. So basically, um, just to confirm what I think I've heard is, is I am going to um, remove that off the 2014 Money Warren articles, mm -hmm. understanding that the door is open, just for the heck of it, so it doesn't disappear off the radar. I'm going to put it on 2015 at $500,000, just so it's uh, right. still out there. Oh, right. and, okay. and obviously, if we go forward with some alternative proposal in 14, that would mm -hmm. be a money warrant article, and right. I would remove it from the 15 CIP. Okay. Did that all make sense? Mm -hmm. It does, but if I may ask, I mean, because I know that you work with the numbers, is there a number that you would support? Because there is a menu of options here from going with an, an, a, an additional bay with a yep. modification yep. up to, you know, adding more bays. Now, it's not uh, sequential in the sense that each bay is just going to be the same amount of money because of the housing costs and whatever, but is there a number, uh, Selectman, that you would find that you would be willing to support? I, I, can, I can respond to it. I, I, I think, first of all, if, if I go back to um, how we ended up with the amount for the salt shed, Okay, we didn't design it. We didn't decide where to put it, and we didn't decide where to put I it. Still okay, hate it. <laughs> but I got into some pretty heavy stuff with conical formulas, looking at how much space we had, how much we could store, what a full year was, and there was a very logical, mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, a lot of work. I probably had a half day into that or whatever. Obviously, I don't hear. But having said that, okay, mm -hmm. Mike threw something out, okay, that he gave some thought to. Okay, he has more background than I do, and and I found his even though there's no basis for it in, in engineering or yeah. cost estimating, I, I found that palatable. If, if, if based on what you said, 
if 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 I said 175,000 with a garage, we'd be you know we, we'd be yeah, blowing smoke. You yeah, can't, can't you can't do it. do it. And if Mike said a tailored down facility that was 475,000, you know you'd say why bother? Yeah, right. But I philosophically, if you look at the stuff that we've gone through and over the last four or five years, okay. Um, a lot of these things have started off, and I'm going to use ideal solutions. They're not necessarily ideal solutions, okay? They're not at that extreme. But a fire station that, that started off at $8 million, that or two fire stations that ended up at 5.7, and I, I don't think that anybody is any less safe with, with the plan that we went with. The Church Street pump station that started out close to $8 million, um, was was kind of respect at 4.8, and then bids came in at, at, at 3.8. I think that the way that we're going to succeed slash survive as a town going forward because a lot of these things, most of these things need to be done mm -hmm. in some fashion is continuing that pattern that was with the fire stations, the church street pump station, the salt shed, mm -hmm. the kids kingdom or whatever mm -hmm. of, of doing it but doing it in a, a, a more conservative manner than maybe towns might have done five or ten years ago just because of the financial constraints that mm -hmm. the people... Let me ask you a question. Maybe this will help clarify some of people's thought. If we remove it from this year for consideration, we put it on 2015, what will it add to I am the forecast for uh, 2015? Well, I'm just doing that for administrative purposes. Mm -hmm. okay? right. so I'm fully pull expecting that mm -hmm. there's a very good chance of Keith coming back to us mm -hmm. with an alternative proposal yeah. for 2014. Mm -hmm. If we go along with that, then it's pulled. I'm just putting it at 15 so it doesn't mm -hmm. disappear off the yeah, so it doesn't I have no problem with that. What, what do we anticipate right now from your notes? What is the 2015 tax rate with all the things if, we've been looking at? If we were to go with everything that's in there, a huge jump. Okay, so 2015 is going to get pretty well loaded up anyway. Depending on what we ultimately do. So we're going to be, we're going to really be very careful what we do the next couple of years because the, basically because the fire station, the pump. I, I think what we have to do is, no is we have to do things and as conservative a way that still makes sense. There's no point with with you know throwing money away on cheap solutions that you got to redo a few years down the line. We've got to make sure that we've got our priorities mm -hmm. in order because I, I think we all know that you can't do everything or whatever. But, um, okay. okay. Um, final one, Keith, the Five Corners Intersection Reconstruction <laughs> and Improvements. And I, I think it's fair to say that there were different viewpoints as to whether or not that was even um, something that was worth doing. And that's had a moderate amount of discussion historically. Maybe Mary Louise, maybe you want to get rid of let it, him basically. Let get rid of it. Get rid of it. It's not, we've got too many other things to do. And that's, you know, that we have a nice neighborhood. We don't want it messed up. And if people don't know how to drive by now, too bad. But I think that's superfluous. Uh, I am absolutely not in favor of touching anything down there. And if people get too frisky and try to go in there and mess around with our intersection, we, we have a few neighbors with a little tar and feathers. So <laughs> Now that we've got the little starting preamble or what you want to call that little load. Uh, anyway. You can save $600,000. Over, over in Derry, over in Derry, there is a five-pointed traffic circle that brings two or three highways together, not numbered highways, not just backwoodsy roads like come into that intersection. And so that's something we can look at. That's a major intersection over in Derry. So it can be done with five points without too much effort. If they can do it, we can do it. People in Derry aren't any smarter than what we are. Well, at least I don't think so. Okay, so <laughs> back to this. Yes. Accident rate there is unbelievable compared to the rest of Hampton. Nonsense. And you know what causes those idiots who live up on Little River Road and Woodland Road to come flying into the intersection and don't stop for High Street people going west? That's it. Oh, don't That's a fact. Stop for people going west. On High Street, I've yes. That's all the combination. All my, there was an accident just a weekend ago that I, uh, my son witnessed, and I could see there was next to all the blue lights and all that. It happens probably every, I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least once a month yeah. there's an accident there with police and the whole bit. And 
The combination, believe it or not, is people driving west on High Street hit the people coming out from the north side, Little River Road or Mace Road. Why they don't seem to understand that STOP means stop, I can't answer the question. I Michael? can't answer that one. Michael. Yes. All right. If people don't know how to drive too bad, once a month is still not justification for ripping up a neighbor neighborhood and spending $600,000, which we don't have. Do we need the intersection done, or do we need a washdown facility? We oh, if I had to choose between the two? Work. Oh, do I get to choose? Do I get yeah, to decide no, that? Yeah. I don't choose the intersection any time. That we don't oh. need that. People need to drive properly. Give them tickets when they get accidents. Do something mean to them. Anyhow, I would take that right off the whole CIP. I, I will move to just take it off the CIP. Pete, can, I, can I ask a question? Get off. Um, the, the information that was provided a couple of weeks ago, there are essentially yep. two approaches, a roundabout at 725000 and a conventional <sighs> four-approach intersection um, with Mace Road connected to Little River at 565. What does the $600,000 in the CIP represent? Which approach? <laughs> The um, the the, uh, the uh, roundabout. Okay, but the information we provided was seven hundred twenty-five thousand for the roundabout. That was uh, worst case scenario, taking into account land, um, taking of some land, and I've met with one of the neighbors, and um, after talking to the engineers, that um, we felt that six hundred thousand that the the project could be de get could be completed for about six hundred thousand okay. dollars but okay. it's definitely what I put in there was definitely for the roundabout option mm -hmm. but there again you know I just identified a need and certainly it's up to this board and the community whether they want to support that project or not I'm not bought into it it's not no know. I understand you know a lot of the accidents were stopped when Keith had his crew Trim the trees back. Remember, shortly after you yes, got here, so because the tree branches were covering the stop sign because we hadn't had the road crews trimming trees. Yeah. I, I would. I would. Another thing we wanted to don't forget though, there's a storm drain that goes underneath there that developed fire ah. a couple of years that ago. The fire so we'll have to look through? under the intersection if we decide to go forward. We have. We've looked at that. Uh, I, I would comment. Um, I've not had anybody. Th this has been around for yeah. what a good year. Maybe two. Uh, I'd say th just two year and a half. Yeah, yeah. I, I've not had anybody comment to me on this one one way or the other. I, I've not had anybody come to me and say, you know, we got to do that. But I've also not had anybody come to me and and say, um, you know, that's crazy. And and to be honest with you, I, I was a little bit. You guys probably go through that certainly more than Four probably years. anybody else on I'm the board. Right and when when the two of you um, were opposed to it, it kind of caught my attention. Do we um, have accidents? Well, I hauled gravel through there for, yeah. for the best part of 30 years, and there was close calls down there all the time. <laughs> part of it was vision. Yeah. Trees were hot, uh, uh, yeah. coming out on High Street mm -hmm. from the Lock Road side, yeah. and you couldn't see down yeah. towards the beach. And the trees were coming out on the other side before they put the sidewalk in. Mm -hmm. So that the cars coming up High Street were going 35, 40 or better, mm -hmm. headed uptown, and they didn't realize there was an intersection there until they get into it. Mm -hmm. By then, somebody had pulled out because there's two stop signs coming out of Little River Road, yeah. two stop signs out of Base Road. Yeah. So they get frustrated because they stop, stop, Tough. and then they think they've made it through the intersection so they go and then the next thing you know they get demoed. Uh, you know, it I think if you slowed High Street down a little bit, coming up from the beach, I think that would help. Mm -hmm. And you gotta keep to keep the bushes cut down there. Yeah. And if well, you make a, a, a loop de loop the there, it's gonna slow everybody down. The 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 good news is is oh, this is not it's not a decision we have to make a break from yeah. the standpoint of being on the two thousand fourteen at this point. Have you seen the one, one on Sagamore? I've been through it. What, one thing, um, th maybe one alternative, um, because I'm I'm ambivalent about, about it myself. Um, Waste of money. Maybe what we want to consider doing is, is it's in 2015 at this point. I think by the time we start looking at, at 2016 more articles in 2015 will have a much better understanding in particular 
to do with the roads and the underground infrastructure yeah. Yeah. and all that. We've the, the biggest the, the biggest increase that we've got in the tax rate forecast is 2015 mm -hmm. over 2014. Yeah. So by moving that out to 16, it would accomplish something um, 15. So to, how do you feel about just simply taking that and, and moving it out to 2016? I get rid of it. As opposed to... <laughs> I mean okay. that. I would, I would make a motion that we move the... Um, because one of the things we tried to do is, is agree on the 14 and 15 mm -hmm. um, foreign articles slash CIP for 15. I, I I'd make a motion I, yeah. that we move it from uh, 15 to 2016. I'll second it just to get the ball rolling because any further it discussion? needs to be done, but I, don't, I think we're getting too much stuff going yeah. on. Any, um, any further discussion? All in favor? To move it? Oh, Opposed? Well, oh. I, I'm well, I don't want to leave it in 2015. That's oh. stupid. But oh. I'd move it to Push. 2020. Do we have a motion. We had a vote. If, um, we can take it again if you're not sure, but it looked to me like Mike and I, I and Mary Louise, it. were in favor of moving it to 16. At opposed? Least kick it forward. You want to abstain? Then we'll fight about it again. Are you opposed we'll to move it to 16? Okay, we'll so you're in favor. Bill? Or abstain? We'll fight okay. about it next year. Yep. So basically, Just what we've done is we've well. decided yeah. to put it out to 16. Put it off and, year. and we have a full Mary one Louise vote be happy with, with that. Uh, okay. Bill yeah. I'm going to make one more suggestion while Keith is still here because the budget is still in process, Fred, right? His budget still in process? Uh, no. No. Okay. No. Well, then I'll throw this on the table. I am absolutely opposed to the Warren article, the Road Capital Reserve Fund article, having the withdrawal section in there. I don't want to put things in the Capital Reserve Fund and pull it right out, and I'm tired of seeing that done. So what I'm going to do is suggest that we see to it, because the Budget Committee removed it, but we see to it that we have $300,000 in the road line in his budget. And we'll do it, I'll do it when it gets to us. So he has money to do road roads. As far as the Exeter Road, that's going to have to build up in the Capital Reserve Fund. But he is going to need money in the operating budget. So I'm just going to throw that out for you to meditate on. I didn't really follow that. He needs road construction money, normal road construction money. Not the Exeter Road isn't the only road in town. He need, the budget committee zeroed out the road line. Okay, so so what budget. you're talking about is an issue to address when we get to the operating yes. budget. Okay, right. so that's I'm nothing to do with. I'm just throwing it out to okay. get you excited. I think we're all set. Thank okay. you very much, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Okay, approval of minutes. August fifth. Page one. Page two. Um, on page one under Roman two, the last word, the big, uh, the last uh, section, the big decision they are going to have to make about the grist mill. It should be the grist mill dam. Mm -hmm. yep. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Page eight, third paragraph down, has the word um, <laughs> applies to not just autonomies, it, but that was automobiles. Which, where, which paragraph are you on? Yeah. Hmm. That is funny. I don't know where the autonomies came Oh, from. autonomies. Oh, yeah, I see it. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Page nine. Yep, I have one on nine. Page ten. Somebody no, want to make I, no, a I, motion? I have, I have one on page nine, please. Okay. Hold on. Uh, on the in the middle of the page, Selectman Pierce makes comments as follows: Understand job of the planning board. Understand it is the job of the planning board. Okay. 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 What happens if they do not have the money? Page ten. Uh, wait a minute. I'll set on ten. Somebody like to make a motion to sure, approve I'll make the minutes as amended? I'm, I'll make a motion. Second. Seconded by Mike Clough. All in favor? Unanimous. I'm not touching mo moving minutes anymore. Okay. <laughs> 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 Glad well, you move your own minutes, guys. For a few seconds. Not Town manager's report. Oh, Brad, Brad, we got Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'll make this quick. The hour grows late. And we have a lot Thank to you. do. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Congress, Congresswoman Carol Shea Porter visited Hampton today and met in this room with representatives from various state and federal agencies to talk about climate change. 
With her was the President's Advisor on Climate Change, who sat and listened with great interest uh, to what had to be said here today um, from the various state and federal agencies. Uh, the town has, through the Deputy Director of Public Works, submitted its comments on the MS4 yeah, draft stormwater permit to the Environmental Protection Agency Regional Headquarters in Boston. That was done on August 12th, requesting waivers to various components of the proposed permitting process. Uh, I also make the comment that we received today the uh, comments from the Regional Planning Commission on the same thing, basically uh, supporting our position. That was very well done. It, uh, there was a lot of work that went into that. It was a very interesting uh, process to go through. Uh, with great regret, the town has received the resignation of Richard DeRoses from the Energy Committee and the 375th Commission. Uh, and I'm going to quickly review uh, some of the things that we received. One thing we received, uh, which I asked for several months ago, uh, the information for contact uh, points for the acting interim supervisor mm -hmm. for uh, yep. the Seacoast region, and uh, we all have that. I've passed that out to the yep. board members, just, <laughs> just so everybody has the information. The Church Street Station, um, they have completed the damp proofing of the exterior foundation walls from the Elevation 18 to Elevation 4. The contract to begin backfilling and compacting between the foundation of the coffer dam with the existing screen stockpile material on site. Wow. Um, as far as the board's pending items are concerned, repairs of Kids, kids Kingdoms uh, has started this week. Uh, we held it up until the end of the activities, the summer activities with recreation. Um, we, I believe the chief answered the questions with regards to timeless of fire inspections. Uh, there is one thing we were notified by the State Department of Public Health today that there is a mosquito pool in Hampton, uh, in Hampton, in Exeter, excuse me, yeah. that uh, tested positive for uh, triple E. Oh. Yeah. So we've notified the Mosquito Control Committee and they've notified Dragon Mosquito to take all necessary precautions. Okay. That's it, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of quick ones for the manager. Or, uh, Ma one. Uh, with Mr. DeRosa redesigning from the 375th Commission, are we going to get a fiscal accounting and from whom? We, at some point in time, need an accounting from... Yeah, a good question. I don't have the answer to that because I don't have all the material. Okay. I just want to throw that out. To come through finance. I want to see yeah. the final... the assumption that there's some sort of a fund balance left yes. or whatever. Well, whatever. We want to see the accounting on that. And the uh, second thing, uh, I we're going to get, I think by Fred's estimate, by the end of August, well, a couple more weeks, mm -hmm. uh, the budget proposal from the, for the for town for the town you'll have it Friday oh my god Ooh. so I had nothing that to do with it Ooh. It's finance <laughs> <laughs> but in that context I don't want to sit here on Monday nights going through that budget in the old days right yeah. we used to set aside a Saturday and do nothing else and have the department heads in and if we needed two or three Saturdays we did that I know it doesn't sound like much fun but I don't want to sit here and try to get through an agenda and not and and not really focus on what we need to focus on. That's a twenty five million dollar budget. I think it deserves more attention than we can give it here on Monday nights. So I just want to throw that out and I'm hoping starting in September we can start don't, devoting a Saturday or two. It may or may not take a lot of time. I don't know. We can segregate some stuff, have just department heads in one Saturday or and then the miscellaneous, you know, another Saturday. But I think we really need to start planning. Even if we go from maybe 9 to 2 or 9 to 1 or something, we've got to devote time just to doing that budget. So I wanted to get you all excited with that. That's my only okay. comment. I, uh, I have a comment to your comment. Um, uh -oh. This will be my sixth year doing yep. budgets on the Board of Selectmen. I don't know what was done a number of years ago or whatever. <laughs> but what we, have, what we have done in the last couple of years has worked fine. And what we have done is added one date, which I think is a Thursday, <coughs> okay, um, where we have um, basically addressed most of all of the general government categories. That has worked absolutely fine in conjunction with the regular agenda. Um, the finance director has already put an entire schedule out, which outlines the, the dates. Um, 
that, that, that you know, when we're doing, I think fire is the first one up. I believe so. And it's roughly about two weeks after we receive. Um, so I, I um, advocate that we continue to do, do it the way we've done it the last several years, oh. which is to add a Thursday date for, for general government. Thursday evening? Thursday evening, yeah. 7 o'clock meeting on Thursday. Well, that's, that will be an exclusive meeting. Which is right. the 12th. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and again, that's got all the general government, which tends to be because of the number of departments, more time consuming than just doing police okay. or just doing the fire. Department. Okay. Okay. I, um, I have a couple of follow ups. Are you finished with Fred's uh, remarks? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Okay. I have a couple of things. Uh, did we anything, hear anything from SA United? No, sir. We have not as of yet. Okay. I thought they were going to deliver mm -hmm. us a list, but that's all right. Okay, and uh, one other thing I was going to comment on about was, uh, let's see, there was one other one here. Uh, uh, so of mine. Now I got distracted, so let's just move on. I'm all okay. set. Old business, 2014 Warren articles. Um, my assumption is, is the only thing that we'll spend any time on in this category is, is strictly the rescinding of the Chapter 79E Computer Community Revitalization Tax Relief Incentive Bill. This is your item on the agenda, so I'll um, yeah, leave you to uh, get it, it started. It's interesting to hear about uh, concern for tax increases. Um, and last year we gave close to uh, uh, $200,000 in tax relief to a, a beautiful project, but it, it was luxury living. And the, uh, um, the square footage, and I'm not going to repeat my entire mm -hmm. soliloquy from last year, mm -hmm. um, the uh, price per square foot on those condominium units that are, I think, virtually all sold, um, was over $400 a square foot. Mm -hmm. And that rates right up there with the uh, oceanfront in, in Newcastle. Um, There are business owners <coughs> down there on the first floor, um, property owners down there that are, are buying those. It's an excellent investment. And, and we, we've heard the uh, folks come in tonight, and I know the hour is late. It's not growing late. It is late. But for those that have uh, paid their taxes uh, since 2008 in this recession, those people that have lost a spouse, those that are senior citizens, those that are disabled, mm -hmm. uh, where has been your tax relief? Where is the tax relief if you've taken a a non-qualifying structure and invested and put your capital at risk and assumed debt mm -hmm. to employ people, uh, but because your property didn't burn down uh, and because it wasn't affected by a natural disaster as it comes under 79E, where is your relief? Mm -hmm. where, where is your relief? Uh, and, and the answer is you've received none. Mm -hmm. And you're still rowing with both oars in the water and you don't receive $176,000 of, of fully earned tax relief. You want a spur built. That's 40% of your spur. Public Works wants a wash station. Mm -hmm. I've, I've run vehicle fleets for a very large government organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe me, the wash down, whether you're coming out of the Med or you're at Hampton Beach, is something you, ha you have to do. Mm -hmm. And out of respect for the men that have been down there and living and working in some very spartan conditions, at all hours of the night, perhaps it's time to invest in their, in their safety and their comfort. Um, you know, the AC is very nice here in the summer. Um, the heat's on in the winter. That's not the case down there with uh, Public Works. So I, I, I talk about revenue. This is fully earned revenue, and it, and it was for a, uh, a luxury project. And I think that um, the type of discussion that we've had going forward last year, uh, the assertion that we don't need to give away uh, fully earned tax dollars. Um, uh, and I, I think that is a pro-development concept. And I think it is pro-business. I think it's pro-Hampton. And I think it's pro-taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pro-revenue. And I think it's pro-town employee. And, and we, we are not in the position to be giving away hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of the minutia, but I, I am online looking at the, at the new um, Conto. Green Company does beautiful, beautiful work. I support their work. I support their, their projects. Class A, uh, world-class builders. Uh, it's a 56-room uh, unit, but they're talking about Contels. Does that make it a 112-unit building? 112 units at the beach. Um, that's where it goes. 
uh, we, we listen to the town um, in, in the research that we've done in the, in the last board when this came up. Um, director, finance director, Mr. Schwozer. Um Debt related to beach infrastructure project. Uh, the last 20 years, $20 million out of taxpayers' pocket. I mean, how much more are we to discount our greatness at the beach and our greatness in this town and our crime-free environment and our beautiful, pristine, clear water why, why are we discounting? This is not Revere. This isn't Winthrop. This isn't Nantasket. I lived in Hingham too. This is Hampton, and Hampton is top shelf. So why are we discounting? That is the debt related to the beach infrastructure project. So that's 20 million taxpayers are out. Now they're being asked to give more. Not infrastructure capital expenditures to the present, which talks about wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. So like the walls, we talked about water. The police station. Mm -hmm. Wastewater treatment plant 2005, aerial ladders that we'll need for these projects, uh, rescue pumpers. Uh, that's 36 million. So, taxpayers in Hampton, uh, without any relief, we're up to 56 million dollars. That developers are coming down now and saying, We need more, we need more. And, and you feel like it's a pro sports team that wants to build a stadium and they everyone gets stuck with the bill and the athletes make all the money and mm -hmm. you're never getting into the stadium let alone in the owner's box. Um, on top of that 56 million, there's a 20 million dollar bond by the state right across the street from the last project at 176 was given. Now we have some small uh, properties on the kind of road. We got a fire station and the lights go off and on, the firemen come and go and, uh, and nobody's given us tax relief. Uh, over there, and um, you know we're within our rights under 79A. Um, we can uh, through the town meeting or special or, uh, town meeting, um, we can rescind 79A. It doesn't have to wait till next March. We can you know, if this 56th unit, which could be 112 unit, uh, we should look at the numbers on a special town meeting if they're coming forward. Mr. Nyan. Uh, could not answer whether the green company was going to ask for this really I would think they would they're asking for a very aggressive project and I think they would ask for this relief and I would too if I <laughs> ran the green company <laughs> so would I. and, and uh, again um, on uh, paragraph 6 79 e3 the local governing body Dunny town or city that has adopted this program may consider rescinding its action in the manner described in paragraph two, and that's either by special or town meeting. And uh, if you can't have a, a, a good purpose for saving hundreds of thousands of dollars, then certainly there's no special, there's no reason for a special town meeting. And that certainly rises to that occasion. Additionally, in 79, it talks about the governing body may adopt local guidelines to assist in determining the appropriate duration of the tax assessment relief period. And that's Paragraph 4 of 79E5, and that's the period. Um, Jamie Steffen will tell you that the planning board has never done that. There are no local guidelines. Not whether to, to gauge whether it should be one year, whether it should be two years, three years, four years, or five years. There are no guidelines, but we gave away 176,000. Full tilt, full buggy. We gave the whole package away um, without any metric for association with how does it comply and what the Hampton people want to have. What the Hampton people want to have because I'm going to read the article that was warranted and that Mr. Moody spoke against at the town meeting mm -hmm. and it specifically talks about affordable housing. The last time I checked 400 bucks a square foot <laughs> isn't any kind of affordable housing I've ever been able to afford. So that's, that's the gist of it from, from there so far, and I promise not to take too long, but I do consider um, this an important issue. I did last year. Uh, Article 31, as it, it, as it occurred in 2011, uh, shall the town of Hampton uh, vote with regard to the New Hampshire Revised Statutes Annotated, Chapter 79A. We heard the uh, 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 Madam Senator speak tonight. Mm -hmm. We heard uh, uh, her eloquence. We heard Mr. Preston. We heard the chairman. We heard other folks. Um, they talked about how this was passed, uh, 2080 to 786. Listen in this, and, and what is read and what the voters read. It, does it say anything about losing 176,000 dollars? 
Um, what does he talk about the metrics? Mr. Chairman, you are, are so adroit and skillful at talking about the cost of an item and how it affects the tra tax rate. Listen in here <coughs> when I read, if there is any mention of the 176, and where this contel that's now being proposed at 100 feet, if this were, would it be five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars 600000 So the town of Hampton vote with regard to the New Hampshire Revised Statutes annotated Chapter 79A to adopt the provisions of New Hampshire Revised Statutes annotated Chapter 79A to permit the Board of Selectmen as the local governing body to accept a consideration request for community revitalization tax relief incentives that are filed in accordance with the provisions of RSA 79A and for commercial structures and new residential structures. And here I have highlighted, which was presented to the voters, especially, and I say quote, especially affordable housing yeah. located along Lafayette Road, the High Street Business Zone, the Professional Office Zone, Ocean Boulevard, Ashworth Avenue, the Business Seasonal Zone, and Industrial Zone. But it goes on about the for the replacement of sus or sus substantial rehabilitation of qualifying structures to include the nature of qualifying structures. And I can go on through that. But you grasp no fiscal cost. You grasp nothing that resonates with the voter other than very accomplished people. Mr. Gerald gave a, uh, an excellent legal explanation of the article. The state senator Stiles spoke in favor of it. John Nyan spoke in favor. Bob Preston spoke in favor. <laughs> Arthur Moody spoke in opposition. I'm here tonight to say that this could cost the town the full amount for your spur. Here to say tonight that when you talk about the tax rate, we're talking about going forward and perhaps offering another half million. Mm. If it's not as if it's not rescinded, when you deny the application under 79A, you've got to have a good reason. Now, if you're a builder and there's money on the table in the terms of a half million dollars, then you're going to start listening to attorneys on why it should have been granted, and that will come because that's business, mm. and that's what I would do if I could afford to build. Mm -hmm. 112 million Phil, <laughs> <laughs> so, so can you get uh, maybe a motion to be put on? No, I just, I, 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 oh, I just, I just, I just want to go this because it's on the record and it's important, and I don't write the agenda, and I think this is the most important item on the agenda tonight. The local government uh, uh, body can rescind this action again, so this is completely in line with the law. I've listened to the uh, uh, state senator. I've been in Berlin. I don't count our magnificence down here in the same way as I would with the needs of Berlin and how they need to resuscitate that area. Um, the town planner has sent back uh, information uh, to me that I requested in the last grant of taxpayer money. Um, there was no explicit or implicit consideration of 79E or 9B, which is a reference to the law during the planning process and planning board review of the seed spray condominium project. So again, the local guidelines were not involved, and it wasn't even mentioned. There was no planning there. And nobody held anyone's feet to the fire on affordable housing, which was presented to the voters. Subsequently, <coughs> and we're now approaching a half year after granting $176,000 of fully earned taxpayer money, there have been no guidelines established by the planning board for 79E post passage of the Warren article, which is now two years, going on three years, and six months since we gave away $176,000. So the law specifically calls for local guidelines. Mm -hmm. This board and the planning board have done nothing but give away $176,000. Mm -hmm. And there'll be another request coming. Who gets the tax break? I had asked the town attorney, or perhaps it is the uh, tax assessor, That's to, to uh, Mr. Gerald, who's here tonight. Who exactly does receive this tax relief? The builder, the developer, the condominium owners? An answer. Whoever owns the unit is a, uh, uh, as of mm -hmm. April 1st in a given year for which the relief has been granted. Mm -hmm. So if those units were not sold by April 1st, they were granted in March, the 176,000. Mm -hmm. If they weren't sold, and I'm not talking about a deposit, I'm talking about a confirmed sale registered, then we know who got the 176,000 mm -hmm. dollars. I think just to clarify, and Mark can, I think I don't think that the credit comes into play until construction is complete. Correct. So I'm just I'm just reading off of my email. Someone's someone's getting the credit. 
and uh, those those are uh, I think they're, they're fully sold out. And again, the public benefit determination. <coughs> Cities or towns may adopt, according to the procedure, provisions that further define the public benefits enumerated in RSA 7097e7 to assist the governing body in evaluating applications. We have we have none of that, none, zero. I mean, we gave away the whole shop, and we in 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 in, in, in somewhat um, contradictory behavior that the law, the senator styles. Drafted, we did none of it. I mean, we didn't. We didn't comply with our end, but gave away the money. And finally, 79E uh, has four criteria that you evaluate on. And number four, uh, and, and this may be important, it increases residential housing in both urban and town centers. And right there, we gave away the full benefit. There's only four criteria. It got a big zero on that, unless you know, 400 bucks a square foot is your idea of affordable housing. But we still gave away, although it's missing that completely, and it was presented to the voters as affordable housing. We gave it all away. So for those reasons, and notwithstanding the greatness of the men and women that, that spoke tonight, and how fabulous the Green Company is and the work they do. Uh, I would think that uh, uh, someone on the board should make a motion to rescind 798. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. Well, I do. I others certainly. I'll second. Are you going to move? Yeah, unless you would like to. No, go ahead and make the motion. I'll second you. Uh, and and Attorney Gerald, is there a, a, a specific wording that I should have for a motion to rescind that? Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you did send this out something. Uh, I uh, sent out what a proposed warrant article would look oh, like right, in that respect. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that complies with the recent. Uh, yeah. Is the motion? The, the motion not would to be to proceed with a warrant article the, the for the voters to rescind 79E. The motion rescind the adoption of 7090, rescinding Article 31 yeah. as adopted well, by Article 31. So that's the motion to place on the warrant right. for 2014 as a Board of Selectmen's article. Yes, that's what I'm hearing. Yep. A warrant yep. article to rescind Article 31. So yes, Phil has made the motion. Mary Louise, you yeah. seconded. Yeah. Um, any we discussion? Have some discussion? Oh, yeah, I'd like to discuss this for a second. I think that. Um, when you're looking at the uh, some of the reasoning that is behind 79E, one, of course, is the affordable housing in the densely populated centers like various towns, and possibly we could apply that to downtown Hampton. I don't think you can apply affordable housing to a piece of beachfront property, however. Right. Now, so what was my thinking for saying it was okay to do what we did already with the old salt mm -hmm. vacant lot. Well, the vacant lot was really rolling us in the tax bucks, as I recall, probably 50 cents on a good day. And now we have a very large building there that is not only bringing in more money, disregarding the tax incentive, because it's even more than that, it offsets that. So we are not losing any money because now we have an empty lot that now is a building, and it could be, I don't know the Greens' finances, and I they probably wouldn't want to share that with me anyway, but it might have been that that tax incentive to help them sell the properties was just enough to make them decide to do the project. I'm not saying it's true, but it's possible. Okay, so when you're looking at from a point of view, what can we do to get rid of an empty, dirty lot and get more tax revenue and, in the long run, a lot more, and make the beach more attractive? There was no choice in my mind. Now, looking forward, as long as we have something like that on the 
table, I would definitely support that. Now, when it comes to affordable housing, I already explained that to some degree. You're not going to have, probably have affordable housing on beachfront property. That probably isn't going to happen anywhere. So you're going to have that like in downtown Hampton Center or close to it so we can have people who live close to downtown, want to live in a downtown, can afford to live there and work there. So I think that what we've done so far with 79E was a good thing for Hampton because I think that that may have enticed the green company to bring forth some buildings. Arguably, some of the prices they're charging, uh, Mr. Bean, are high. I won't argue that. But that's how I feel about it. I think it's a very positive thing for Hampton. I have, uh, I have some comments. Um, I, I think Phil is essentially correct mathematically on the old salt property. As a matter of fact, he mentioned the exact number. Last week when he brought it up, he mentioned 200000 It's actually $35,000 a year, um, which equates to the 176000 number that he brought up. So that's 176000 over five years. It's actually 35000 a year. However, there are, there are several perspectives from which one can view the financial impact of 79E, all of which are valid. Um, this is not about right or wrong, okay? It's about mm -hmm. speculation and opinion, and that's kind of where, where, where Mike was headed there. In the case of the old salt property, which was a parking lot on four lots prior to the development of the sea spray complex, they were paying forty dollars to $45,000 a year in taxes, mm -hmm. okay? Had the buildings not burned in 1999 and had you had the added value of the buildings on top of, of, of the land there, um, based on the assessor's estimates, the taxes would have been between seventy and $80,000 a year. So forty to forty-five, just the land, seventy to $80,000 once the va value of the old buildings was there. The assessor estimates that the sea spray complex would have paid $218,000 without the 79E exemption and $182,000 with the 16% per his calculations with the 16% 79E exemption approved by the selectmen for a five-year time frame. So the parameters are again, as a parking lot it was 40 to 45,000. It would have been 70 to 80,000 had those buildings not burnt and still been there. It popped up to $182,000 with the sea spray con uh, complex on it that would have been $218,000 without the 79E exemption. Mm -hmm. While Selectman Bean's figure is accurate when viewed from one angle, it's also true that the sea spray complex will be paying $140,000 more a year or $700,000 more over five years than the parking lot that was there. Hmm. That 140,000 annually is estimated to rise to 175,000 in year six when the 16% exemption goes away. The key question, and back to my original point, key question in determining a positive versus a negative financial impact on the town is would these developments, this one or one similar in the future, go forward in the same time frame in the same manner without a 79E exemption, okay? One can only speculate on that. And I think that the, the, the correct answer to that is, is some will, some won't, some will go d forward in, in, in a different fashion. It's, it's impossible to know that. In addition to the direct impact, and this is actually the assessor's impact uh, comment um, on this one, new development will have a positive effect on surrounding property values and can spur additional development, redevelopment opportunities as we're seeing. Beyond the math and speculation and understanding that there are different people on the Board of Selectmen now than those that put the 79E exemption on the ballot in 2011, mm -hmm. the Selectmen placing a Selectmen-sponsored Warren article on the 2014 ballot rescinding 79E only three years after the Selectmen sponsored mm -hmm. 79E in the first place gives the appearance of a fickle board, at least from an institutional level, even though there are different members. In Hampton, a board of selectmen puts it on the ballot in 2011, mm -hmm. and they're pulling it off in 14, and it's all about what angle you want to look at these things. 
As Phil pointed out, the voters approved 79E by a margin of 2,080 to 786. Mm -hmm. I feel that doing a 180 on the 79E, especially just three years into it, just sends um, the wrong message. I think it sends the wrong message to developers. I think it sends the wrong me message to investors. And I think it sends an overall mes wrong message about the Hampton Board of Selectmen that we could do something that serious, given that whether it's good or bad is, is totally speculative, and then turn that around three years later when, when there, there's just absolute evidence that there is momentum in upgrading the west side of Ocean Boulevard. And I'm not going to say that wouldn't have happened without 79E, but what I would say um, is we don't really know how much of an impact it is. But I am, I am just not in favor of this. I'm not in favor of it, in particularly um, this, this quickly. And I believe I'm, I'm somebody who has a track record of being um, conservative financially, trying to keep taxes down, looking at things logically from all kinds of angles, and beating up the number. My gut feel, and that's all you can have because it's intuitive, is that 79E is good for Hampton in the long run. So that's my input. Any further discussion? Yeah, I would say that uh, the uh, architect of the uh, bill, Mr. Chairman, specifically uh, makes address for local guidelines. They were not done. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I disagree with the assertion that the board looks fickle. I think that's exactly why Senator Stiles and her, her uh, compadre at the Senate made a specific pr pr provision in the law to rescind by a special town meeting, by the way, for the town meeting and town meeting. So I, I don't think the board would look fickle. I think the board would look strong in representing all taxpayers. I think it's visionary and I think it's modern and it does not reflect or impugn the, the great judgment of selecting peers or you or anyone else that voted for it. It's just a new board, it's a new day, and it's a lot of money. Are we ready to vote? Well, I want to make a really quick comment. I can't believe that $35,000 exemption per year would, would inhibit any developer from carrying forward a project. And I look on this a little bit, and, and a lot of the stipulations that should have been put in place apparently have not been. But I look on this a little bit like the 149 vote when the Board of Selectmen in 89 decided 4 to 1 to allow Rye into the sewer system. And there was such a huge backlash on that that the voters took the authority away, which is still gone to this very day. And I think after two or three years here to reflect upon what, what is happening potentially with this, uh, that the voters may uh, have a, a second thought on the wisdom of keeping this in place. Uh, just because you keep banging your head in the wall and expecting a different result doesn't mean you have to keep doing it. We're ready to uh, vote. Yep. All in favor? All opposed? 3 2 with Pearson Nichols opposed. Um, next item updated warrant article list. Um, I purely put this on the agenda mm -hmm. um, just so yeah. everybody would know that Christina has gone through, updated this with some of the decisions we made um, yeah. last week, added um, yeah. CBAs and so on and so forth. I didn't have any intention, particularly at this late hour, of covering cool. yeah. any of the. Uh, Warren articles. You, and you want to discuss some of the ones that have been added next meeting then, Mr. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't think that. We don't need to fiddle at it I don't now. think that. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Right. Um, new business. It's an item under the, on the um, agenda on a new business, 19 L Street leases. Um, quite frankly, there was a, have a motion informational yeah. letter from the assessor. Yeah. Um, I've not seen a recommended motion, so I, I, Mark, I maybe you motion. can elaborate because I wasn't clear what this was I all about. I guess the motion right here. Oh, you go. will you pass it over? Let him look at it. Oh. <laughs> see what he says. That's no problem. I can just say, Pretty Mr. Clear, Chairman, on, okay. on, on, on this one, wh our practice since I've been here, whenever we have a new tenant in place, is to write a new lease for the new period. The lease is since 1996. We have a 2% land rent. Yeah. Uh, one of the yeah. things that was done not done before is 
that we didn't insist that the lease be recorded by us, mm -hmm. which meant that sometimes they weren't recorded. Right. <laughs> and we didn't insist before, <laughs> before my time here that the old leases be terminated when a new lease was written. And that could lead to all sorts of yes. problems. Yeah. And in this particular case, this is one of the worst because we kept having new leases written and old leases not terminated. Yeah. Uh, and whenever the, the uh, in this particular case, there was a, a, a mortgage that was foreclosed, huh. and the mortgage description referred to an old lease rather than a new lease. Ooh. And then when the mm. bank went to foreclose, they had their own problems because they didn't notify everybody. So this, is, this, is, this one particular property has been a problem for several years. And now it's coming to a head where we will have a new tenant. Hopefully they won't be on the list of delinquents that we have to pursue. But nevertheless, it's important to terminate all the old leases so that they don't have, which would still be in effect time-wise. <laughs> so that's why you see all these termination documents. Yep. Yeah. It's the worst example of not crossing the T's. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm clear what was going on, but without having the benefit of a motion, I wasn't sure I'm why sorry. it was on here. Do you want to make that motion, Mike's Mike? motion. He's prepared to read it. Okay. Uh, motion for 19 L Street. I move have the board sign the four termination of lease documents and a new lease to Preventure Real Estate LLC for property at 19 L Street to be held in escrow pending the closing schedule for August 30th, 2013. Do we have a second? That's the shortest one you've seen for me yeah. in a while. Yeah. I seconded it. No, oh. that's it. Good. I'm voting. That's it. You seconded it. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm voting it. in favor. Yeah, she's ready to vote. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> Unanimous. Thank you. I did not hear you second. Thank you, Mark. Any other new business? Good night. 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 Yeah. That's what I thought I'll you said in your email. I'll move the consent agenda. What makes you think they're going to do I'm that? Second. Mike, two, second. Mike, we have one meeting going on here. Second. I know, but we haven't finished wow. that one yet. Wow. No. Oh, that's part of this? Yes. Oh, because it's got a separate clip on it. Well, it was designed that way, so you wouldn't skip it. Do you want any? Well, so I can just go over onto the second page and sign, right? Give him okay. Okay. First item on the consent well. agenda. Parade and public gathering permit. Seafood festival, September 6th through 8th. Um, I'm going to make one comment on that. The state fee is $100. The town fee is $5. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. Two, I think we ought to change that. Two, solicitation permit, local 2664, Hampton Firefighters, 64 Ashworth Ave. Third, number of uh, seafood Perfect. festival yeah. sidewalk vendors license. Second Amendment gifts and military souvenirs, 247 Ocean Boulevard. Mohab's Jewelry, 237 Ocean Boulevard. No, that's not Maya Mini Mall, 235 Ocean Boulevard, Unit A. Memma Kami, 225 Ocean Boulevard. The Third Eye, 105 Ocean Boulevard. So we had a motion by Mary Louise. The second was by Mike. All in favor? Unanimous. Any closing comments? Oh, yeah, it's time to adjourn. Move to adjourn at 10:40 p.m. Seconded by uh, Phil. All in favor? Unanimous. Nice job, people. Four.